minutes. We have a few. So once I show my slides, I won't be able to see, I won't be able to admit people. So I'm trying to keep an eye on it. All right, I think we'll get started. So I'm gonna share my screen. Let me know if you can see what I see. What do you see? We've okay. got your slides. See the Perfect. slides. Perfect. Perfect. All right. So welcome. Thank you so much for signing up and coming tonight. I um, put in Meetup that um, I run two uh, groups, PA Restart and Palmerton Outdoors. I used to run a group called New Jersey Restart because I moved from New Jersey to Pennsylvania in 2019. I'm originally from Pennsylvania, um, but I've lived in New Jersey for seven years. And I started um, P New Jersey Restart and PA Restart because I, I wanted a place backpackers and new hikers to go and new kayakers, um, outdoors people. So I had gone on a trip with another group of hikers and uh, it was a great hike, but I had to work. I was on call that weekend. So I ended up taking a call and I ended up in the back, which is usually where I hike anyway. And uh, there was a woman who had gotten lost, who was with the group for the first time, had never been hiking. Um, and so she was crying and she was so upset. But, you know, there really should be a meetup group for people who are brand new to hiking that are that need easier hikes that are not really hard because a lot some of the groups go really, really fast, or they'll plan an easy hike, but it's an easy hike for experienced hikers. So that was why um, New Jersey Restart was started, um, to provide opportunities for people who um, didn't grow up with hiking, people who didn't um, hike, you know, while they were raising their children or working in their careers and are getting into it in retirement, uh, for people who are differently abled or, um, and then people from what we consider unlikely hiker categories, people of diverse backgrounds who, you know, don't see the trail as their home. So um, this is a passion of mine. Um, and I, I, I'm letting people in as we go. Just, I figured out a way to do that. So um, so this is a passion of mine and I'm so you're here with me tonight. I looked through Meetup to see if there were any introduction to backpacking or intro to hiking things. And there was a few, but then you had to pay and I don't like that. So I decided that I would just do one for free. So we're gonna talk about your next adventure. There are four of these there um, every other week on a Thursday night at seven o'clock. This will be the same link that you'll use next time, but I'll send it out again. And you're welcome to come to all four or you're welcome to come to the ones that make the most sense. Uh, tonight, we're gonna be talking about, we're gonna be talking about planning a route and uh, your gear. So that will be everything that we cover tonight. And hopefully we'll have enough time. Uh, you don't see this, but behind my computer, I have all of my gear, both winter um, and summer for all four seasons. I have all of my gear on my table. So when we get to the gear point uh, part, I'm gonna get up and get things so that I can show them to you. And if at any time you have questions, Slinky has promised to be a faithful, faithful assistant. And uh, he's gonna gather questions for me because those I can't see. So this is who I am. This is, uh, uh, during the day, I'm Associate Dean of Online Learning and Educational Technology at Northampton Community College in Bethlehem. I was a tenured English professor, in, uh, in, I was tenured in English for a very long time, feels like a hundred years, um, and have been an administrator for uh, the past several years. I recently moved from, the, uh, from New Jersey to back to Virginia to my home. I was born and raised in Bethlehem. So that's my career kind of stuff, but my passion, the reason I work is so that I can do everything that you see on this slide. So I'm, I'm not a through hiker. I've never been a through hiker. I'm a hobbyist. I tried to make that real clear in the meetup description that I'm with you tonight sharing a love of a hobby that I have. I'm not an expert. I do go to trainings. I'm actively certifying to lead hikes with AMC. I'm certified to lead hikes with the Girl Scouts and I'm very passionate about hiking, but everybody has his or her or their own style. So I might tell you things tonight that you're like, oh, that I would never do that. That's okay because you're gonna hike your own hike. And in the trail community, 
and or and in your family, your trail family, you might have things that you do that make sense for you, and that's perfectly okay. This is just a list of my tips, the list of the gear I have, um, some of the trial and error I went through and picking gear. And uh, I learned to hike, um, hiking, my father was a steel worker, my mom didn't work outside the home. And uh, hiking wasn't part of my life. And then I, uh, when I was in college and graduate school, I worked at a sleepaway Girl Scout camp in Pine Grove, Pennsylvania. And they said, here, take nine-year-old girls for two weeks on the Appalachian Trail. And that's how I learned to hike. But that was a hundred years ago when the external backpack thing and, um, and uh, there weren't cell phones. You had to carry this big like thing that was like a purse and you had to carry one and the other leader had to carry one and together it called people. And so a lot had changed between that time. And then I went and started my career, raised my kids. And uh, my mom it was up in Connecticut uh, with us at the end of her life and she couldn't walk anymore. So I started geocaching and I wanted to take all the steps that she couldn't take and getting into geocaching led me back into hiking and going get, getting back into hiking led me to backpacking and that rabbit hole. So these are the places I volunteer and I'm a member of Lehigh Gap Center, which is here in Palmerton. I helped before the COVID sprang out, I was helping them or starting to help them coordinate uh, Girl Scout troops and youth groups and things like that. I'm a volunteer at the AMC Harriman Center in New York. And uh, just recently <laughs> I was uh, appointed the um, Delaware Valley um, Assistant Chair for Communication, which is the newsletter that you get if you're a member of, of that. Um, I'm on the disaster response team for Carbon County and that includes deployments anywhere in the 50 states uh, for natural disasters. I am very active in Girl Scouts. I lead a Girl Scout uh, senior troop and also volunteer and do this kind of thing with adult women, helping them take their girls out. Um, so we get more girls and women on the trail. And I'm a member of Sierra Club and a volunteer uh, with the B program at Lehigh Gap Nature Center. So that's my backpacking, trekking, outdoor resume, but that isn't what you came to learn about. So. We're gonna start off and we're gonna spend five minutes watching a little video because the very first thing that we have to pay attention to when we're on the trail is leaving no trace. So that's an actual thing. It's an actual principle that we follow and it is the way that we can promise forward um, the environment. So this may be stuff that many of you have heard and, and have seen a million times, um, but any trip that we go on, we try to be as, um, to leave as little a footprint as we possibly can um, so that we can save the environment. So hopefully you will be able to hear my audio and I'm just gonna make sure that it will show, it'll play the sound. So I'm gonna play it and then hopefully it'll play sound. Do you hear it? Yes, anybody sign? Uh-oh. It's really tinty. Did you click on the two the two check marks at the bottom of your share screen for the sound? Let me see. I thought I did. Okay. Hmm. Maybe it's easier if I watch it on YouTube and share it off of that. We can try that. All right, we're gonna try one more time, but Heather, if it's tinny, tell me, and then you all can watch this later, but you'll promise you'll watch it, okay? All right, now it's not even letting me in there. Oh, no. All right. All right, now it's not letting me watch it at all. All right, so you will all promise to watch the video later. The very first step of Leave No Trace is what we're doing tonight, which is plan ahead, plan your trip, make sure that you're planning for success. You want to have a good experience the very first time that you're out and you want to plan so that you know that you're going to pack everything back out. Uh, we want to leave footprints and take memories. We don't want to leave anything on the trail. We're going to scoop um, cat holes and poop in them away from the trail and away from drinkable, uh, any water. You're going to, you're going to um, gout anything that is uh that doesn't belong in a forest setting, right? And you're gonna stay on established trails and you're gonna camp in places where other people have already camped. We're not gonna establish new spots to camp and damage foliage because it only takes uh, one, camp, one tent one night 
um, to start impacting um, the foliage underneath. So you want to establish um, uh, you don't you want to use established uh, camping spots. All right. So that's uh, leave no trace in a nutshell. And those are the principles that we keep in the corner of our mind when we're planning our trip. So our very first. Our very first thing is where, how do you even find a trip? If you're a new hiker, how do you find them? You look in different places and they look amazing, but you know, you think you need to have tons and tons of experience to do them. Uh, the Appalachian Trail is one of the long trails. Uh, the Triple Crown, um, does anybody know what the Triple Crown is? We'll quiz the audience. What's the Triple Crown? If you do all three of these long hikes, you are a Triple Crowner. What are they? I know what it is. <laughs> so, okay. <laughs> so yeah, it's uh, the three long trails are the Appalachian Trail, the Continental Divide Trail, and the Pacific Crest Trail. Right, that's the Triple Crown, but there's lots and lots of long trails in the United States and in other countries, and um, you can do sections of them, you can do parts of them, um, you can be a weekender, right? So every kind of hike is a good hike, right? Even if you're just out for an hour, even if you're doing, a, you know, a two mile loop or a one mile lollipop, hiking is hiking and you start where you start because that's where you're comfortable. So, you know, backpacking is um, hiking with an overnight, and I'm gonna say this a million times, camping is camping. So if you wanna go car camping and you wanna take your, your cast iron pan and you wanna make amazing meals over the campfire, you wanna go car camping because you have to carry every single thing with you when you backpack. So when you're choosing a route, you wanna make sure that you're choosing a route and keeping in mind all the gear that you have to carry with you when you go on that route. So what you do is you have an honesty inventory. That's the very first thing you do. If you're going alone, it's a little easier because you just have to talk to yourself. But if you're going with a group, you have to ask the group this question. So uh, some of the hikes that are coming up for restart, you know, I'll be reaching out to each of the people that signed up closer to the events and asking them these questions. Um, you know, so after you figure out how many people are going, you want to say, what is the skill level of the slowest hiker in the group? And don't be discouraged. If you're a slow hiker, don't be discouraged. You know, you're, it's not a race. It's a journey, right? And if you can only hike a mile an hour, that's fine. We have a silly rating in PA Restart that Heather and I came up with. <laughs> and it's rabbits are the fast ones. They go three miles an hour. Turbits are turtle rabbits and they go two miles an hour. And then turtles go one mile an hour. They're the slow hikers. I usually run the turtle hikes. Heather runs the turbot hikes. We allow rabbits to come, but we try to be very honest and clear that our hikes for P8 Restart are really designed for rabbits and turtles, or rabbits and, uh, sorry, turtles and turbots. I get it all right, Heather? So once you know this, the skill level of your slowest hiker, you need to plan the trip for that person because everybody else is going to get frustrated if you know, they're going really fast and they're having to wait up for this person because you always need a person in the front in the back of a hike, a sweep and a lead. So you always need that person in the back. That's usually me. Um, and you, you don't want the, the leader to, you know, have a miserable time if, if uh, he or she or they're expecting a very fast, per, you know, a fast group of hikers. And then they have six fast ones and one really slow one. It, it can it can ruin the flow of the hike. So um, know the skill level of that slowest hiker. And then Think about how many miles you have been able to cover in the last few years. Now, when I was 18 working for the Girl Scouts, I could probably go 30 miles a day. I am not 18 anymore, and I cannot go 30 miles, and I don't want to go 30 miles a day, right? So a good hike for a good new hiker is between six and eight miles if they're on the slower side, eight to 12 if they're, or eight to 10 if they're on the faster side. 12 to 15. A through hikers average for a day is 15 to 18 miles. Some, some through hikers hike a lot faster than that, especially as they get more used to the trail and they 24 mile days and challenges and all kinds of things. But um, you're a, at a good speed if you're doing eight miles a day. So if you're going on a Friday and you're doing a weekend trip, you're going to do two miles in the first night to set up camp. You're going to do eight to 10 miles and eight to 10 miles. So you're thinking about a 20 mile hike at the most. So you want to find a route that suits, you know, it's nothing is more disappointing than planning a 50 mile hike and saying, oh, I can do 10 miles a day. That's only going to be five miles a day. And it's the roller coaster and you're going up and down and your slowest hiker can't do it. 
right? And then it gets to be frustrating. So you definitely want to plan for success and plan a trip. You can always go farther. You can always turn around and go, you know, back the other way that you came if you finished it early. But you want to be able to finish and have your goal in mind. And your goal is whatever makes you happy. I love water, waterfalls, uh, swimming and diving is my first a swimmer in high school. I was a diver in high school and I was a, a diving coach. So I love water. So all of my hikes always have water in them. I like vistas. They're great, but they're not my first love. So if I don't get to a vista, I'm okay, but I love to get to water. I like to be at sunset and sunrise of the water. I like to camp on the water. I like to see beavers and turtles and all kinds of stuff. So that's when I plan a hike. That's what I'm planning for because I want to, I want to have some kind of reward for working hard. Yeah, if I'm going to go up and down a mountain and struggle, I want to finish at a lake or a pond or a stream or a waterfall right? And you want to be honest about what you dislike. Some people are terrified of bears or terrified of spiders. It's okay, right? It's okay to be terrified of those things. You can, there, there are things you can do. Um, you know, uh, the, the bears and the snakes are way more scared of you than, than you are of them, believe it or not. And there's a lot of things that you can do, but you need to just be honest about what your fears are. And if you've never been backpacking before, you're not going to sleep the first night and it's okay. Take earplugs, you're going to be nervous. Every little sound is going to sound like an elephant running through the forest. And you're going to think, you know, every bear in all of Eastern Pennsylvania has come to eat you. It's a chipmunk probably, or even just like a falling leaf, but you know, it's okay. You know, it's okay that those fears are natural and, and don't be um, upset if you, if you get a little nervous. Of course, you want to figure out your favorite season of the year. My favorite season happens to be autumn. So that's when I'd love to go backpacking the most. I backpack all year long and, um, I have never, till this past year, I had never backpacked in the winter. This is my, uh, last year was my first winter season. And, um, and um, you know, that's a different kind of backpacking altogether uh, based on season. So, um, you know, just know what time of the year that you like to be out and then know how long you can be away from school. Cause remember there's drive time to and from the trail and you might get really tired and be really tired on that Sunday. If you do a weekend hike and you may need to stay a night at a motel. So, you know, just plan for whatever time you need that you can be away. Make sure, um, you know, if you're looking at a certain area like the shed or something like that, that you know what the permits are that you're going to need to get before you go into that land. And during COVID, a lot of places have different rules about how many people can be in the park. Some parks are entirely closed. So just know before you go, make sure that you know if permits are going to be needed and if there are any alerts in the area, especially now pertaining to COVID. Any questions about these slides before we move on to the good stuff? All right, the top three, distance, train, and weather. How far you can you walk in a day? What is the terrain like in those miles? So let's say you know you can do eight miles a day. Is that eight miles up a mountain, eight miles down a mountain, or is it eight miles on a flat, right? Because you can walk a lot faster on flats, right? So it's all flat and it's farmland, you could probably do 10 miles. But if it's straight up a mountain with a lot of rock climbing and stuff, if it's Lehigh Gap, that might be a five mile day, right? So you want to know what the terrain is like and you want to look at maps and we have a session, I think it's the next session, that will be about how to read a map, a topographical map, so that you can tell what the what the terrain looks like. Um, and then what is the weather typically like that time of year? So, you know, and that changes every year because of, <laughs> because of whatever, like the weather changes. So, um, you know, March is usually a good time to start hiking, but we might see snow still in March. So um, you, you can't always guarantee the weather, but you can at least do a best guess. Um, are your permits needed? And then, and I'm going to mention this a thousand times, you want to print out a physical map. All right, you want to print one out. You're going to put it in a Ziploc bag and Ziploc bags are going to become your very best friend. I put everything I own in them. So my Ziploc bag is my wallet, my first aid kit, everything I have is in a Ziploc bag. You want to print out a map and you want to um, give a copy of that map to someone back home and say, this is the route that I'm planning to take. You're going to have your map on you and you're going to have um, your identification information. So your name, an emergency phone number, any medicine that you're on, any conditions that you have, it really helps, especially with disaster response. If we have to go come and get you, um, if if you have that information, it makes life so much easier for the people that come for you to help you. Um, you want to keep that Ziploc bag with that map in it on your person. So not in your pack, 
not in your fanny pack, like physically in a pocket on your person. Because if you drop your bag or your fanny pack falls off or you're in water, right? It's going to be a lot easier to get that out of your pocket than it is going to be to get it, look through your bag and find it. So keep that on your person. And then um, one thing to just think about if you're brand new to backpacking, how far away are you comfortable being from civilization? If emergency vehicles had to come and get you, like how long would it take? And is that a concern to you, right? I do, you know, I do recommend that if it's your first time or even the first few times that you not go alone, you know, take a buddy, buddy system always works. Um, but Wi-Fi doesn't work everywhere. You might not have cell connection everywhere. So you can't rely on, you can't rely on cell phones. So you, you definitely want to go out with somebody the first few times that you're going out. So this is where I look for, um, where I look for trails, um, all trails. They have a free version and they have a paid version. And the free version is good enough when you're starting out. Once you get involved in hiking and you get more passionate about it, it is definitely worth its cost for the pro version. But in the beginning, all trails will um, give you everything you need. And what you want to do is just go to alltrails.com. And then up here, um, you type in where you want to go, what area you're thinking of. And then it'll tell you the difficulty, like Lehigh Gap East, which is the easier side of the gap. They rate it as moderate. I would not say that's moderate for new hikers. I would say that's difficult for new hikers. Um, they say Lehigh Furnace Gap is hard, and that is hard for new hikers, right? So don't always trust these ratings because sometimes they're written by I don't know who. It'll tell you the length. It'll tell you if it's a loop or a lollipop. It gives you a description. Um, it'll tell you the route type that it is, and um, it'll have comments from people. So definitely read the comments, look at what it says, and then think about um, all of the, you know, all of your concerns that you have about the hike. You want to kind of factor that in. The other place, oh, so you want to check the rating, you want to read the description. Then I take the trail name that it's called in all trails, and I just Google that. I put quotation marks around it. And I Google the trail name because lots of people write blog posts about the trails and you can get more information about them. But you want to watch because all trails is not updated that often. They'll put a trail up and then they never take them down. And a good example of that is Glen Anoko closed, I think, two years ago now um, because it was getting too costly for EMS to rescue people who weren't listening to the signs. So they closed it, but it's still all trails. So you want to, um, you want to, um, make sure that the trail is open. Um, you wanna make sure that you're hiking on a trail that has a map. So when you're first beginning, um, you know, the Appalachian Trail is well blazed. It's white blaze, you know, it's, um, it's well blazed for the whole 2200 miles, except in sections where it's not, the trail clubs haven't done a great job. But for the most part, when you're on the Appalachian Trail, you can follow the trail. Other trails, it's hit or miss whether the trails are marked well, sometimes are intersecting trails and that makes things confusing. Even here with the Appalachian Trail, Lehigh Gap Nature Center has their own trails, but then there's a, there are um, like a hunter's group has trails and they use white blazes too, but they're not the uniform Appalachian Trail blazes. So you can get really lost up in the Lehigh Gap Nature Center section the Appalachian Trail is because there's white blazes that have nothing to do with the AT. So you want to make sure that you have a map with you. And then you want to ask around. There's a lot of hiking groups on Facebook and Twitter, a lot of um, hiking groups on Instagram, LinkedIn. You can um, ask, hey, I'm going to Georgia and I would like to find a very short a flat that'll take about two hours to do any recommendations. And then take the names of those hikes and do your research in all trails and in, um, in Google in general. The other place where I look for hikes, because I do hike the AT a lot, is uh, I know this looks like it was written in 1987, and it probably was, but it's very handy and it's very accurate every year because it's based on the 2020 uh, each year's data book. This is the distance calculator for the Appalachian Trail. So you just stick into it um, where you're starting and where you want to stop, and it'll tell you the miles between. It'll tell you anything that is in between there, any shelters, any um, overlooks or anything like that, parking areas, and then it tells you the ascent and the descent. And so when I'm planning a trip for a PA restart, I use this to make sure that the that it's not that steep of an incline in that section. So um, so this is Blue uh, Blue Mountain Road to Bake Oven Knobs, 5.9 miles, 
this would be a full day hike for the new group, but it doesn't, it's very rocky, but it doesn't have a lot of steep stuff, hills. Any questions before we move on? These are my tools. Any of my other hikers, do you have any other tools that you recommend? Effie, I use the um, <laughs> the AT interactive map um, mm. for, for AT. That's a really good resource for how to get to the trailheads and shelters. And I think it might have Topo as well. I, and I also use Guthook, the app. Yep, Guthook. On the AT, I use the Guthook app, um, which is, uh, it goes on sale every year at Christmas time. So that's when you should buy it. And you can buy all the maps for super cheap. And that has, a, it has maps for each of the states. And then I use that and that's updated sort of not live, but like it has shuttles in it and it has all the hostels in it and it has comments that you can read from other AT through hikers. So if you get really into AT hiking, I definitely recommend the, um, the uh, Appalachian Trail um, resource that Jim is talking about. And then also uh, Gut Hook. I use Gut Hook. I, I like them all. I think they're all fascinating. I think Alda puts one out too. Alda, Alda has a has a trail list that they use as, that they put out too, I think in PDF form. All right, so now we're gonna have some discussion. We have two cases here. I want you to figure out which one is gonna be more successful. So in case study one, we have Cassie and Lola. Cassie and Lola are new hikers living in New Hampshire, and this is their first backpacking trip. They decided to do a section hike of the AT in the Whites, the White Mountains, in November and over Thanksgiving break. Cassie and Lola are in pretty good shape, so they think they can walk about 15 miles a day like the average northbound or nobo through hiker they've met in New England. Do you think that they're gonna succeed or fail? What do you think? You can just they're gonna, in. They're gonna fail. Fail. They're gonna fail. Why are they gonna fail? You don't want to be in the whites in November without being really prepared. Okay, hey, and and so the White Mountains, right? Are Katahdin closes at the beginning of October for a reason, right? You can't summit Katahdin legally unless you have a. There, there are exceptions to that with gear and people, but most people can't summit Katahdin after October, first weekend in October usually, because it is so brutal up in New England in the winter months. So definitely terrain and weather are not in their favor. Any other reason they might not be successful? They're not going to make 15 miles a day. They're not going to make 15 miles a day because they've never been backpacking. So they don't, they might walk, they might be able to walk 15 miles an hour or 15 miles a day, but with a, you know, a 30 pound backpack on, that's a whole different, um, whole different expectation, right? All right, so let's look at Javier. Javier is an avid hiker, but has never backpacked before. This will be his first time. Javier used all trails and AT distance calculator to find an AT section near him that offered some pond views. He'll hike two miles Friday night, eight miles Saturday, and six miles Sunday, and he will camp near AT shelters um, both nights. Do you think he'll be successful? Yes. Why? Well planned. Okay, he's planning it out. He's got reasonable mileage. Reasonable mileage for a new, a new backpacker, right? He's done his research ahead of time, right? He's, he's definitely packing in something to, to see and do, right? So he has much more, he has much more opportunities to be successful. What are the things that you think derail people when they go backpacking? What are the things that make a hike miserable or a backpacking experience miserable or what's, you know, what do you sometimes, think? Sometimes I think people think they can do more than they actually can. And then it turns out to be not fun. Absolutely. It's that's absolutely like they, um, they get, you know, it, it doesn't seem hard when you're sitting at home. <laughs> it doesn't seem like, oh, I have to carry 30 pounds of crap on my back and it's going to be easy and I'm only going to walk half a mile and it's going to be fine, right? So they have overinflated ideas of their ability and they don't plan properly or do enough research, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, the planning of the trip and planning your gear, like you have to account for every ounce that you're going to carry. 
and I'm not a hyperlate fanatic because I learned before hyperlate was even a thing, but, um, but I am cautious and careful about my weight. What are some other reasons it derails? They derail. Bad. Yes. Is this bad weather? Bad weather, right? When you're a new backpacker, like if you, um, you know, you go out and it starts raining, um, you know, like you have to be, you have to plan that weather is going to happen, especially if you're on a vault, right? If you're up in, uh, you know, past tree line and, you know, weather happens. So you want to be prepared and, and have realistic expectation and know what to do in case of an emergency like that, right? So you need to definitely have the right clothing and that applies to coldness too. You I mean, it can be June and you can be freezing at night. It just depends where you're camping and where you're at and, and what the weather is like. So you want to, you know, pack smartly. What else? Number one thing that derails people. It's the number one thing you think derails people from having a good time. Maybe what? not dressed properly. Not dressed properly. That's, that's very close. And it leads to this. It is the number one reason people get off of the AT and the through hike. Their feet hurt. <laughs> well, that, that's part of it. Injury. They're Injury is the number one reason why people stop their through hikes, uh, followed closely by money. They run out of money, but injury is, you know, they, they are, you know, pushing, you know, they start at Springer and they're trying to push 20 mile days because that's what they saw on YouTube. And you really like, you have to start off small, eight miles a day for a few weeks. And so you build up trail legs and trail muscles as a section hiker, you never really get to build up those trail muscles right? As a weekender or as a day hiker, you don't really get to build up those muscles, but through hikers over time, by the time, if they started in Springer and by the time they get to my yard in Palmerton, they've built up those muscles and they're eating, you know, large calories and, and, and they're pumping through, but um, good footwear is essential to any good hike or backpacking. So I'm going to just grab something on the other side of the table. I'm going to show you some shoes. Now, lots of people are very, very picky about their shoes. And so I want to tell you about, I want to tell you about my shoes. I have all kinds of different shoes. I have shoes for snowshoeing. I have, um, I wear trail runners and that's what these are. So you can see the bottom has, it looks like a sneaker, but the bottom is a hiking boot, right? And these grip, these are oboes. And this is the brand that I like right now. I've worn Solomon's, my, my snowshoeing boots are Solomon's. I like them too. I used to wear hiking boots. I used to always use hiking boots because back in the olden days, that's what they told you to wear. And I, I hiked in hiking boots till about four years ago when somebody told me about trail runners. And I like to have my ankles free because that's how I get around rocks. It really is personal preference. So if you like to have that very tight, your ankles locked in place and it doesn't move anywhere and that's what helps you get up rocks, then go with, um, go with them. Your best bet is to go shopping for shoes at night when your feet are the biggest, right? And you can go to REI and you can try them on. Um, and I'm going to talk about REI in a minute. Um, and one of the reasons why I like to get shoes there, but go at night when your feet are the most swollen because you need a shoe that's going to fit you. And you will typically go up a size in your hiking shoe than you typically wear. And you want that extra room because in the winter, you need to wear more than one pair of socks. So Wow, that's interesting. I never heard that before, and it totally makes sense. To go at night. I didn't know it either. And like, I was like, oh, that, that makes sense. Yeah, I have bought in boots that fit so nice. And then when I would wear them, they were too tight. And I couldn't understand it because I wore thick socks to try them on and everything. So you're, the trick is to go at night. And so your shoes your shoes matter. And that is the number one, like if you're going to pay money for gear and I'm not a gear snob there, I have some nice gear now, but I didn't always. Um, and I'm not a gear snob. Walmart has great stuff. Amazon has great stuff. You want to pay attention to durability and weight and read the reviews, right. And ask people, but if you're going to spend money on anything, spend money on your shoes because you're going to put, I put, I think like 400 miles on my Solomons before I finally retired them to have around the house shoes. Um, when they finally got a hole in them, I was like, okay, well now it's time. I loved them because they've become your life and they're your lifeline and your feet. I don't get blisters 
So, um, and that's because I take really good care of my feet. I take my shoes off in camp when I'm done hiking for the day and I put on, I wear flip-flops, but you can have Crocs, you can do uh, water shoes. You wanna take your socks and shoes off at night, let your feet breathe, sleep in your tent with your feet raised a little bit, like put them on top of your clothes or something. Um, and that'll bring the swelling down. And then just check your feet every day for red spots. Some people even do like a chafing, like a her, um, there's a little thing called her that you can get at REI. It's like an anti-chafing thing. That works really great. Um, you can put cream on your feet, whatever you do with your feet. Um, I don't get blisters, but if I, if I get a hot spot, like a red spot, I'll put Luco tape on it or moleskin. And that kind of stops it in its tracks. I, I haven't had one in quite a few years and, um, if you get uh, plantar, if you have plantar fasciitis, you want to you just be really careful about that. Talk to your doctor. Um, you can get if um, and I recommend these. I mean, I'm going over here to reach for something else. I just got a new pair. You can get inserts for your shoes. They're called Super Feet. I don't know if you can see this, right? And you just you just put these in your shoes. This is just a new pair that I just got, and you put them inside your shoe. So I'll put these in into my oboes and um, they add uh, some more support and they're definitely worth it. And you can trim them down if, if they're too big for your shoe. Do you take the inner sole of the shoe that's existing out to put that in or do you just put that in besides? In my Solomons, I didn't, I put it on top and mm -hmm. in these I won't. In this, I'll leave, I'll leave the sole, I'll leave, I'm, feeling inside now, I'll leave this in. These are new, I just got them last month and I hiked in them. I hike in them first to break them in before I put the thing in. Mm -hmm. so, um, so I'll leave this in because so the oboes are known for their insole. So this is just extra padding to give you, you know, to make your feet a little happier. Heather, do you wear insoles? Or no, I didn't, I don't. I had a pair of Salmons that I loved. And then um, I bought a new pair of Solomons and they wrecked my ankle because I like boots, boots. And so I have this new brand, I forget what I bought, but I don't wear the insoles. So this is Heather, the other hike leader for PA Restart. And Heather has hiked all over the, all over the world. So she's gone on some very long hikes in some very strange places. Great stories back boots. So um, yes. So um, yeah, so um, what I can say about insoles is that um, I do use them um, and everyone's foot is built a little different and they make insoles in a variety of uh, shapes, sizes, and most importantly, arch support amount. Um, I, I happen to have pretty flat feet, but um, what I did was I went to a running store and I tried on literally about six different pairs uh, until I found a pair of ins inserts that, that fit the shape of my foot properly. And I can tell you that they're really, uh, really important. I uh, hiked about 500 miles of the AT without them one time and got plantar fasciitis in about 175 miles. So without them. So pampering your feet is the best thing you can do on trail, like really, because they're doing all your work for you, really. If you think about it, those feet are doing they're doing the miles, right? So you definitely want to take care of your feet. Um, and we're gonna talk about packs. Um, these are the systems we're gonna talk about tonight. Uh, packs and poles, water, shelter, sleep, food, sanitation, and safety. And again, I am a hobbyist. This is my kit. Jim's gonna have a slightly different kit. Um, Heather's gonna have a different kit. You might have been out and have a different kit and that's okay. Um, it's not a competition. <laughs> so um, I'll just show you what I use. And, uh, and we can talk about different choices that you have. So I made this handy dandy chart just as a, and you'll get these slides afterwards so that you can look at it. So that you kind of just have a quick one shot look at what you need. Um, you definitely need hiking shoes, no matter what kind of hikes you're gonna do, whether they're day, weekend, or um, two or more nights. Um, if you are going out for a day, you should always have a pack on you. Some people think they can use their pockets and stuff. You should always have a backpack of some kind on you, a lighter backpack, but because you need water and you should have a water filter, you're going to need a thing to put all this stuff in and you shouldn't rely on pockets to do that. If you're going one night, it depends how far you're going from civilization, whether you need a pack or not, a, a day pack or a, a long distance pack. Um, but 
you know, it kind of depends on where you're going and how, how, like if you're going out at eight in the morning till 10 o'clock the following night, you probably want a bigger pack. Um, my pack is a 55 uh, liter pack. I'm going to show it to you in a minute. I have two packs. Um, so you don't need that for a day hike unless you're practicing. If you're going backpacking, one of the best ways to prepare for it is to go on day hikes with your backpack, with your big, with your big girl, big boy, uh, big person backpack, right? Go out with that and hike around with it. Um, but for the most part, if you're just doing it, uh, you don't. You should always have your headlamp, right? We don't use flashlights because that requires your hand. So we wear a, a headlamp and you should always have that on you, even for day hikes, because sometimes you get in the middle of the forest and it's dark or a storm comes and it gets dark. You always want to have a headlamp with you and you should always check the batteries before you go out to make sure that it's working. Um, uh, some people tent and some people hammock. I am a tenter. Heather's a tenter. Are you a hammocker, Jim, or are you a tenter? Or um, I'm, I'm a tent guy. A tent guy. So I have hammocks, but um, I really only use them in my yard to read. So, but you don't need that during the day, unless you're hiking to a pond and you want to have a hammock to read in. Uh, you don't need that for a day hike, but you will for one or two nights. You shouldn't, you shouldn't, um, rely on a shelter being free, especially during um, bubble time, what we call the bubble of the AT. If you're on the AT, the shelters first go to the through hikers. And if they're not occupied, then, then other people can use them. Um, but during the bubble, which for Pennsylvania, where we are in Lehigh Gap, that's June and July, um, those shelters get full. And I actually don't like shelters. I don't like sleeping in them because there are mice and snakes. And I'd rather just be in my own tent where I have privacy in my own little world, my own little little squeak happiness in my own world. My name does not come from my, I don't dislike mice, I actually like them, but squeak actually comes from noises I made as a child when I cried, not from mice. But, um, but shelters are great in a storm. Like if it's like whip and wind and it's crazy, crazy. Uh, the times I've stayed in a shelter, it's been under those conditions. Um, sleeping bag or quilt, I have both. So in the winter, I have a zero degree bag, which I'll show you. And then I have a quilt that I use in the summer and I have a sleeping bag, depending on the trip and a liner. I sleep cold. So I like to be all snuggled up, uh, but I have to carry that extra weight if I'm carrying all those different pieces. So it just depends on the hike and where I'm going. You always want to have water purification with you, even if you're doing a day hike, because you don't know if something's going to happen and you're going to get stuck and need to wait for somebody to come get you. You want to be able to purify your water. Um, your food snacks, like if you're going on a half mile hike, you might not need food or snacks. Um, some people backpack cold, so they do cold cooking without a stove, and that's an option. Um, there are all kinds of different stoves. I don't actually use a stove. I use a jet boil because I boil all of my, I boil water and then I pour it into Ziploc bags and I make all my food this way. Um, but I also have a pocket rocket, which is a little stove. Um, and I also have an alcohol stove issued by the army to my husband. So I have all the different stoves, but I don't do a lot of cooking because honestly, by the end of the day, I'm tired and I don't want to fuss around with that. I also don't build fires very often. You definitely want to have some kind of um, trowel. Um, some people use their trekking coal and that's okay, but to dig a six inch hole for your poop, I mean, you're standing there forever with a trekking pole, or you can get a deuce, which is a, what I have, which is a lightweight trowel, and you scoop, and then you poop, and then you put everything in there, and then you cover it back up. And the only thing that you put in there is toilet paper and poop. That's it. If you use wipes, like I use, I do take wipes with me because I want to feel fresh at the end of the day. Those, even if they say they're biodegradable, you should still pack those out for leave no trace. Um, you always want to have hand sanitizer on you. What I do is I buy a big bottle of it, which I have here. I buy a big bottle and then I put it in, um, and I put it in little bottles, little lightweight bottles, but I buy a big bottle. It's cheaper that way. And then I put it in little bottles and then I have one on the front of my pack. That's just on my um, things that I can use anytime. Your hands get gross a lot. Um, you want um, smell proof food storage. I'm going to show you that when I show you my, 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 um, your sack and the liner in my bear can, um, because you definitely need to put your smelly stuff away from you so that if raccoons and bears are hungry, they're not coming knocking on your tent or your hammock to get it, right? Um, you wanna have all your chargers and electronics, right? Electronics suck up a lot of juice. I actually carry a lot more electronics than I probably should. So you definitely wanna have chargers and battery bags for those. Ziploc bags are your very best friend. And that's one thing where I'll say that brand matters. When you cook in Ziploc, it has to be the freezer bag Ziploc brand. 
dollar store will melt. Ziploc doesn't melt. Um, you always wanna have a compass um, on you and know how to use it. So we have a session on how to use your compass. You wanna have your map. I do encourage carrying a whistle. I know a lot of through hikers don't do that, but I'm a Girl Scout and we like whistles. So have a whistle. I have, I have a whistle compass combo on my pack so um, that you can blow that if you have an emergency in it as a, as a disaster responder, those whistles help us find you. Um, and then you wanna have your contact information on your person. You wanna have trekking poles. Now there's always debates about trekking poles and uh, these are what they look like. These are foldable ones. I know like this isn't the most ideal thing, but they break down. And I'll tell you that I love them. I didn't use them when I was younger because they didn't, I didn't know about them. Um, but as a, as a, you know, a middle-aged woman that's had children, I love them. And these just break down and then I can fold them up and put them in my pack when I'm not using them. These are the Black Diamond brand. I got them on sales, I think at REI. But trekking poles help you go up and go down. You use trekking poles, Heather, is that right? Yeah, yeah, um, I started to. I was and I was like resistant for the longest time. And then, so I did part of the AT where there was a big, huge uphill, died on it. And then the next time I did it with the poles, it was amazing, amazing. Went up way quicker. <laughs> Jim, do you use poles? Yeah, I use them all the time, except on level ground. You know, I'll just stick in my pack if it's level. Flat. Yeah, when it's level ground, I don't use them. I do use them in camp too to poke things. <laughs> poke at things with them. Yeah, I have a trekking pole too. For snakes. I use them for that as well. Yeah, I bang on the rocks for snakes, especially when you're going through a real rocky area. I'll bang on the rocks to see if I can see any snakes coming out before I stick my foot in anything. And then um, if you're afraid of bears, just like, you know, walk and bang them as you're going because the bears will hear you and they'll go the other way. Um, and then luxuries. And the, everybody has their luxury item. My luxury item is a pillow. I have an ultralight backpacker's pillow, which is right here. It's down filled. And then I put, um, you can, they have like a little pillow thing that you can, that's in it, but you can take that out. You can actually put your puffy in it. Right now I have my liner in it. So um, this is my luxury item because one of the tricks of backpacking is you can sleep on your bag full of dirty clothes I don't want to smell myself at night. I don't want to be comfortable. So that's my, and I have a journal. That's my other luxury item. All right. So this is my kit. And um, this is, I like imaginary three-day trip from AT's Pine Grove to Pine Grove Furnace. Let's say I'm going in March, right? So I have my oboes. I have my, my black diamond um, poles. I use, um, I have two backpacks. I'm going to show them to you. This is uh, the one tigress. And it's an all-in-one. I don't know if you can see it. It's an all-in-one. Um, it's ultralight, and I like that. But it, everything is in this big main pocket. And then the only thing I can really put out here are is my expandable foam mat. So um, the water bottles go on the side, and I use smart water bottles, which I'll talk about. But this doesn't have a brain or anything like that. It rolls down, and it is super light. So as far as lightness goes, I love it. But I'll tell you. I miss my Gregory, which I'm going to show you next, because I do like the pockets. I'm a, like, I'm such a pocket person. I'm not a purse person, but I like, this one has a brain. This is your brain here, the thing that kind of flips over the top and, and clamps down. I don't know if, you can, if I'm doing it as well enough that you can see. Um, and it's got different compartments. There's a compartment for the rain, the, there's a, a rain cover for it. There's pockets in the front where my journal can go. The only thing is this is heavier. So the more contraptions and pockets and things that you have, the heavier the bag is going to be. So I sacrificed like organization for lightness, but this year I think I might switch back because I do really, really, I don't mind carrying the extra little ounces, to be honest, because I like to have all my stuff organized. It was very hard for me to, I would have to go through my entire pack to find stuff in the Tigris. So this is Gregory and the other is a Tigris. Tigris I got on Amazon, Gregory I got at REI. So there's my, my packs. I have a headlamp, which I lent to somebody and they didn't get back, but I have, I have a few of them and I don't know where any of them are, but it's just a, a headlamp that I wear around. And honestly, I wear it all the time. Like I just have it around my neck and then it's there, but I keep it in, um, your backpack has a, ha, have these, um, 
And if you can see it on the side for the hip belt, there's little pockets here. So I always keep my pocket knife and my headlamp when I'm not wearing it in this pocket. And then on the other side, I have M&Ms because that's my snack when I eat lunch. Right? <laughs> what kind of pack do you have, Jim? Um, <clears throat> um. You're muted. You're muted. Sorry, can you hear me now? Okay. Yeah. Uh, so I used to have a uh, Gossamer Gear Mariposa and now I have a um, CPAX Arc Blast. Oh, I'm sorry, Arc Hall. Is that an all-in-one? Yes. All in. Uh, Heather, what do you use? Do you use an all-in-one or? Um, I have several. I have a 70 liter, which is the all-in-one, you know, because when you when you travel backpack. Um, and I forget, that's like an overseas brand, like a German brand or something or French. Um, and then I have a Gregory that I got from REI. It's a 45, and I love that one. I had a 55 before that I was all in one that I love too. But the, but I'm with you with the Gregory one with all the pockets and everything. I, just I like it. It's worth the extra weight, to be honest, because I can find stuff. I can't find anything in the Tiger. It's is light. I give it that. It's light. But um, so I carry a puffy jacket, which is here. And a lot of your stuff will come in these 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 bags that make it squishy. Right. So when you pack your pack, you're going to press this down and see how small my puffy jacket comes. And so some people will use their puffy as a pillow, but you can't use your puffy as a pillow if you're wearing it. So I'm usually wearing it. So as I get cold at night. So I have my puffy jacket and then I have insulating layers. So number one rule for any kind of outdoor activity, don't wear cotton. Cotton kills. You want to wear wicking clothing and it'll say wicking on it. Even at Walmart, Walmart has tons of wicking clothing, right? In their Avia line, look for socks that are wicking, look for shirts that are wicking, that wick away, um, wick away the sweat because cotton doesn't dry fast enough. Merino wool is your very, very best friend. And you can get those things at Walmart. You don't have to spend a million dollars for darn tough socks. I like darn tough socks and I wear them, them in farm defeat. Um, but you can get great socks at Walmart. You can find great socks at the thrift store. Um, you don't have to spend a million dollars. So for shelter, um, I just got a new, I, I had a big Agnes and I just sw switched it. So I'm going to show you a few different ones because I want to show kind of like the point. One of the big, <laughs> knocking stuff over here. Things are going to hell over here. Um, one of the biggest challenges is finding the right tent and listening to what people say online. So in the beginning, when I first got interested in backpacking, I looked up ultralight tents and I went on Amazon and they were like, this is a light tent. And they sent me this giant thing, which weighs like eight pounds, right? This thing is so heavy and it's so big, right? It's two person, it's so big. So even if it says ultralight, you can't trust them. You have to look and see what the poundage is. And they're going to give you the poundage with and without poles, right? The poles are what weighs the most, right? So, and the stakes. So you want to make sure that, that the weight is something you can handle. So um, then I got another tent, which was much better, which is a Big Agnes. And Big Agnes, you pay more the less material it has. Apparently, that's the way it goes. But you have your poles separate from your tent, but this tent, I had a Kelty Monarch for years and years and years, and I loved that tent. I loved it, it had two doors. It had a front door so I could greet my guests and then a back door that I could pee out of at night, right? <laughs> I loved my tent, but it was old like I am. And finally it started to leak and I couldn't fix it anymore. So I went and I got a new tent. And uh, this is a great tent, but it's an only a one door tent and it's on a diagonal. So for me to get up, and I'm not like the most agile person in the planet, um, it was like an act of like, you know, like I was a circus person and I couldn't get out of my tent. And then I like, I would have to pee out the front door where my friends were gonna come and visit me the next day. So I just traded this and it is, I mean, it's still, it's ultralight, but it's still a little bit heavy. Um, and I just got a tiger wall. which is this big and super light, right? This is ounces compared to the, um, the other big Agnes is also light, but this is lighter than that even. And this what is that, that one again? 
This is a Big Agnes. So Big Agnes is sort of the leader in ultralight tents. They also have sleeping pads and stuff like that. Um, but they're the, you know, I, I don't know. Jim, what kind of tent do you have? Do you have a- um, I, I use a uh, Z-Pax Soloplex. Okay, and that's the, is that the, that's the one that always looks clear to me. Like when I yeah, see so it's, it's made out there. of um, uh, DCF, uh, Dyneema composite fabric, and um, it's really lightweight, but it's it's single wall, so it's it's not probably the tent for the first time backpacker, um, but it weighs a pound. And that gets put together with uh, trekking poles. Yeah, it's it? a trekking pole tent. So you do. So you, you definitely want to pay attention to that. So tents come with stakes, or they're going to expect you to use your trekking pole to put it together. So you definitely want to practice in your backyard putting your tent together, no matter what kind it is, whether it's a pole, one with poles or one like Jim has that's that you use your trekking poles for. So you want to pay attention to that. You want to pay attention to the weight um, and it'll give you a few different weights. And so this, it just arrived. Um, I'm going to reduce the weight even more because I'm going to take away some of the packing that comes in here because I don't need all that. And I'll press it down a little further in the compression sack and the footprint is in its own packaging, which I'll get rid of. So, um, so you definitely want to um, start off small, try to borrow gear from people if you can, if you're just gonna try it for the first time. Um, and I'll talk about why I like REI be because of their exchange policy. It's a little bit of a pain to turn stuff in on, on Amazon, which is why I like REI. Um, but if you get really interested in backpacking, it's worth it to buy good quality gear for your sleep system and your tenting system if you're gonna do it a lot. Are there questions coming in a chat and I'm not seeing them? So yeah, so someone, uh, Kennedy Jones said, sorry, I have to go because of class, but love this and look forward to seeing the recorded Zoom after class. Oh, who is this? Good to know, love, it, but was looking at later options. Okay, so Pat, um, there are lots of later options. Definitely read the description, especially on Amazon because these people lie and they'll be like, oh, this is our, uh, the hike and bike, I think is the place where I got that. And they're like, oh, it's ultralight. That is not an ultralight tent. So definitely look at the specs and then ask around before you buy anything, ask people, go on the forums, like go on Facebook and just ask, like, I'm looking at this tent and people will tell you the God's honest truth about anything that you, anything that you have. All right. And then I use now this new big Agnes came with, with the uh, footprint because I bought it from an outfitter who's going out. But um, most of the time I don't use that. What I use is it's my other bag. You don't need a footprint. The footprint is the thing that goes under the tent. You need something under your tent, but it doesn't have to be the footprint. I use Tyvek and you can buy this super cheap on, on Amazon. You just buy a piece of Tyvek, make sure that it's big enough that your tent goes over top of it. And then you put this, you put this under because the, um, the, uh, footprints for these tents, which is protect your tent. The purpose of them is to protect the bottom of your tent from getting holes in it. Um, these footprints, especially for the big Agnes can be 80 to hundred dollars. This was 12, right? And this is going to get damaged. That footprint's going to get damaged. This Tyvek's, you know, going to maybe last half a season before I might have to replace it, right? I'd rather replace something that's 12 bucks than something that's a hundred bucks. So. Uh, yeah. And if, if you know someone who does construction, they use Tyvek on the side of the house, as you see, before they put the siding up. Yep. And if you know someone in construction, you can even dumpster dive and maybe find a piece that's big enough that they throw away. I'm always looking for it. Yep, Tyvek is like, it's like a magical thing. It does so many cool stuff. And that was like a pro tip that I learned from another hiker when I was out on trail. And uh, you should definitely have something under your tent though. You know, don't not have anything, but you don't need the footprint necessarily. And that's why they sell them separate. Right, because the tents would be so much more expensive with them and then you have to replace them. So um, my sleep system, I have a few different ones, a few different ones. Um, I didn't get this completely in its bag because it takes forever, but my winter bag, this is a zero degree bag. So you can see it looks like a big mushroom here, but it fits into this case, right? It's a zero degree bag because of winter camping. I actually just had it out and I didn't get it all the way back in before this because it takes an act of Congress to get it in there. Um, so it packs down small enough to fit in my pack. Um, the zero degree bag is wonderful in the winter months, but I don't carry this all year. 
most of the time in the when I'm out, I'm out in the fall and then in um, in the spring, oops, things are falling everywhere. I use a liner, which is this a, a Thermarest liner. It's like a giant sock. And um, I got the extra long one because sometimes like in the summer, I don't want a lot on me. And this is real light. I need to have something on me, but I don't want a lot of thing on me. And then I have um, a, a quilt, which is upstairs. I have a backpacker's quilt. And then I use that and that's, that's super light. I do have a sleeping bag that I sometimes use like in the fall if I want something in addition to my quilt. And that's this, this is just the REI, the REI one. This is a mummy bag. So sleeping bags are formatted. Um, a mummy bag is real tight fitting. And then a square bag is a little bit more open, but then they tend to be a little bit heavier. So again, check the weight and try it out. Like try it out, like lay in it with all your clothes and see if you move around. I'm a tosser. So I need something that's gonna roll with me. So I went for a mummy bag. Um, I don't like it that much. I like the quilt better. And my quilt has a foot box in the bottom so I can put my feet in it so that my feet always feel comfortable no matter how much I'm twirling around in my sleep. Um, so you wanna, if you look at quilts and you wanna pay attention to what they're made of. Some are made from down and some are made with synthetic down. Synthetic down takes forever to dry. So if it gets wet, you have to hang it off the, your backpack the next day in the sun to get it to dry. Um, and um, you know, so you wanna just be careful um, of getting getting it wet, getting it in, in the water. Jim, what do you use? Do you use a quilt or a sleeping bag? Um, I have a uh, I have a mummy bag. It's a Western Mountaineering Versalite 10 degree. And also have a, a Z-Pax uh, classic uh, hoodless bag. How about you, Heather? What are you, what are you snoozing in? Uh, I need to buy one for this country. So uh, I don't have any yet. I was in the Middle East, so like. Oh, you just <laughs> need to keep the sand off of you. <laughs> yeah, no, you need a sleeping bag because it gets cold. But um, a lot of the stuff, times your car, you're taking your car with you. So even with my tent, our, everything was heavy. I had a mattress too. So like. <laughs> well, I'm getting to that. So um, <laughs> the other thing that I that I do is um, in the winter. Um, you want to be off the ground, right? So you're going to have that liner in the Tyvek, you're going to have the bottom of your tent, but then you need protection between you and the ground to keep you warm. So I do two things and I don't mind carrying the weight. Um, ultralight, this is where I kind of, I kind of separate from the Hyperlake community. I have an expandable pad. This is a Thermalite. Thermalite. This also makes a great seat at the campfire. You can also get smaller ones if you want. For the campfire or you can I, I don't take both of these sometimes I'll take this on a day hike um so I have this but then I also have an ultralight inflatable pad so I do my accordion pad and then my inflatable pad which is here um it's not wrapped up very well because I just had it out to clean it um but this is ultralight this is sea to summit it's um it's an inflatable pad I got the extra long because I'm a tosser and I can wrap my um there's hooks on it so that it wraps around um the inflatable pad or the expandable pad and then my sleeping bag also hooks to everything so everything stays together so we all roll together so um, you want to be you want to be off the ground that will keep you warm. You don't want to be on that cold ground. Beth, there's a question from Julie. She says, I'm not exactly sure. She says, besides being lighter, is it better than a tarp? Well, I was referring to the tie back because you were talking about the. Oh, I'm sorry. And I'm oh, it's only used, tarps. I've only ever used a tarp, so I was curious. So tarps are great, and that's what I started with. But they're really heavy. They're a right. lot heavier than you think they are. So the tie back is super light. Like it's ounces, where the tarp that I had was like a, having another tent. Like I started with a tarp, and then I was like, "Oh, this is so nice not to have to carry it." And it's actually easier to clean. That doesn't seem like it, like being that it's white, it seems like it would be harder. But the Tyvek's really easy to clean and easier to fold because all you have to do is scrunch it up. Where with like with with the tarp, you had to like roll it a certain way and jam it in there. That's a great question. That is a great. Uh I have Thank a question. You. I have sure. a question. Um, in terms of packing your bag, uh, I noticed that you're using the stuff sacks and I bought an Osprey 
50 liter and I'm sorry that it was my first thing that I got and I'm sorry I got a 50 liter I think a 60 would have been better that said I tried to get everything in my bag and it only worked when I took the stuff stacks and got rid of those and put the sleeping bag at the bottom and then the tent and so on and so forth do you have any thoughts on that um a fanny pack get yourself a fanny pack so I know that sounds ridiculous, but you can keep a lot of your smaller stuff, like your first aid kit and everything, and that will save room in the big pack. Um, and then, so, and then the other trick is what you've already done, which is get rid of the pack, get rid of your stuff sacks, like your clothing sack. A lot of times hikers will get rid of that and just stuff their clothes in around in the gaps within the mm -hmm. back. I still use a sack for my clothes, but um, I have taken that out and stuffed my clothes all in so that it goes around all the other stuff and took up the room that way instead of having a separate bag for the clothes. Mm -hmm. I but also then, use the trash bag in there so that yes. if anything, if it was wet, I would, I would be safe with that. Thank you for mentioning that because I forgot. I always put a garbage bag as a liner in my bag, either bag. Um, and just a, it's just a hefty garbage bag I put that in there and then um, that way if things do get wet it doesn't you know if the packet if it's soaking soaking rain it doesn't affect the stuff inside that is a great pro tip thank you for mentioning that yeah most uh, most through hikers use a uh the trash compactor bag which yep. is a little harder to find in a grocery store but because I, I guess there's not that many trash compactors anymore but it's a heavier plastic bag it weighs about two ounces and it's huge um you can put in your in your bag as a liner and put everything in it um and a lot of a lot of folks don't they just compress their bag at the bottom and it sort of helps fill the cavity and to your point i think um most people go out and buy a pack first what you really should do is go out and buy all your bulky gear first and then sort of see how big that is and then buy a pack that is going to you know fit for that gear and and like and so like here's an example of a bag right that I bought early, I bought a three set of from Columbia, right? Look how long this bad boy is. This is a long bag. So I would not be able to fit this full in my backpack, right? Mm -hmm. So I use these for kayaking. When I do kayaking, um, I'll use these longer bags for like extra clothes for kayaking and throw them in the front of my kayak. But I wouldn't take this big bag with me backpacking. Right. I do use smaller bags for stuff, but I tend to use Ziplocs for everything. I'm a bit of a Ziploc girl. The other thing that I want to talk about is permethrin. So once a season, you want to spray down your gear. So this keeps ticks and things away. Right. And um, you can get this anywhere. People feel different ways about it, but I always spray my gear at my clothes. And um, after about I don't know, three or four washes, I spray it again. Um, but at the beginning of every hiking season, I spray down my pack and all of my out, outside gear. Cause I, I carry the expandable yellow on the outside of my pack. So I spray that down so that ticks, if they jump on it, they'll get off of it. Um, so you wanna spray. Yeah, and wear, wear gloves if you use it. Yes, wear gloves. Yep, wear gloves if you use it. I have a question about the garbage bag in the pack itself. Are you talking about like a kitchen bag because it seems to be more the size of a bat of a backpack? Like the tall the tall contractor bags? You're um, talking like yeah like heavy duty plastic bags? I've seen mostly the, the well there's two different kinds there's the clear ones I think he's going to get his I don't have one here I'd show you. Um, it's I felt like it would be so big and bulky to put that in your pack really it actually it, it doesn't weigh they don't weigh a lot mm -hmm. um like it, you're it's serving as a liner i think jim went to go get his to show you what his looks like because i took i take mine out at the end of the season and get rid of them and put new ones in so i'm all i just brought all my gear up from the basement he, here it's it comes. Kind of, oh it's like a kitchen bag yeah, yeah it's so like it's a kitchen a, bag this, look, this is a compactor bag i don't have a trash compactor but this is how this is how big it is yeah. So it, it'll fit in any, you know, 60 liter backpack or even 70 liter. And um, what I do is I put it in, I put my sleeping bag in the bottom. I don't put my sleeping bag in a stuff sack. I just put it in there and any of the clothes that I don't need, like sleep clothes or anything like that, I'll put it in there. I want to keep dry. And I just, I just roll it down, roll it down and press it down and I put my food bag on top of it. And it helps compress my bag down the bottom and it 
helps helps fill everything up at the bottom of the pack. Yeah, and that's such a great segue. People do that. I never really did that because I usually just hike when it's nice. I don't hike this, it. In this anyways, it only weighs two ounces, and it'll keep your down bag dry. I've hiked for uh, four days in the rain, and I've got a down bag and didn't get wet. Um, and uh, I've bought fancy uh, Denema composite bags that are, you know, really expensive and maybe a half an ounce less. And they got holes in them. And these are, I don't know, they're a dollar and a half a piece or something. You, you know, it, use them for a month. And when they get a hole in, you get another one, you know. Yep. Yeah, that's great. Yep. That's very helpful. And that's a great segue, Jim. Thank you. To the kind of food storage that you can have. So he talked about your food bag. This is your sack. This is a large one. And I'm gonna put it down so I can show you your, your other options. There are some places where you backpack where it is required to have a bear can. And this is a bear can. Also makes a really great little side table, um, but it takes up a lot of real estate in your backpack, right? And it's heavy, empty, it's heavy. So I don't often, if I don't have to hike with this, I don't, um, but I have it. And you can see all of my smellies are in there. I put a bunch of stuff in here. So you can see there's like oatmeal in there. My toothpaste goes in here. Anything that smells like anything goes in your, your, your pack. Now some through hikers stop hanging their food. That's not the best practice. You want to make sure that your food is away from you. So um, your biggest concern really isn't bears, it's raccoons. Raccoons and mice, they like your food. So you see, this is my food bag. All of my smellies go in it. This gets tied to a tree that's away from me, like 400 feet. I make sure that I know I can see it, right? And then um, so what I do is I take my trekking pole. I do this when I go to the bathroom too. I take my trekking pole at night and I stab it with the handle facing the direction that my food bag is in because I will forget by the morning. And inside of it is a liner, a real thick liner. You can see it's like a super duper, super heavy um, Ziploc bag. And you put your food in there, all your smellies at the end of the night. My gas is in here for my jet boil. All my food is in here and then I tie this to a tree. I roll it down, I tie it to a tree and then it's away from me. Some, some places like down at Springer Mountain, you can hang your bear bag. They have, um, they have bear cords where you can hang your bear bags um, up on the, up that way. In New Jersey, all of the shelters have um, bear boxes where you put your food in a box that locks and the bears can't get it. So know before you go what you're expected to do with your food. Um, some places, because they because you need a bear can, some hikers won't camp there. They'll hike through until they get to a place where they can have their bag. Jim, what do you use? And Heather, what do you use? Um, I I started using the uh, the Ursac uh, last uh, two years ago. I hiked in the Continental Divide Trail up in the Grizzly Country, so I took the the Ursac and then I had the um, the Opsac inside, which is I think what you had uh, yep. for for odor. And um, I loved it because you know I didn't have to I didn't have to throw a rope every night. And a lot yep. of, in that part of the country in Montana, there's very few limbs sticking out that you know that you can throw a rope on anyway so it's, right. it's hard to get, it's hard to get a good hang so um and um you know I'm, I'm going the pacific northwest trail this year and i'm going to take the same thing and that's a really good point thank you for mentioning it because i don't hang it i don't throw up i've never i don't know how to do it. i mean i've done it like in outdoor training things where you hang a bear bag up on a tree limb and i don't have eyesight good enough to see like that so it never worked for me. It was always super frustrating. This takes away all that frustration because you're just tying it to a tree. And, um, and nobody's ever gone after my food. I've, nobody's ever gone after my food ever. So, so um, go ahead. When you tie it to a tree, what do you tie it like four or five feet on the trunk of the tree? So you just, you kind of like put your arms up. Yeah. And then you just, you, this is going to be wrapped down for like, 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 let's pretend this is like the food I actually have. Hold on. Get this out of here. Or my things. Beth, there's a question from Pat M says, do you have the standard or sack or the almighty? I have the almighty. Yeah. That, I, that's why I have two, the bigger one. I have the bigger one because I, I want to 
want to be able to have choices. I don't know what I want to eat tomorrow. So you can see I have it rolled and then there's two cords here. And then you take this up to a tree as far as, 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 as high as you can hang it, as, far, as high as you can reach. And then you tie it around the tree, a few loops with this. And then you- So, I mean, raccoons can climb. They don't they, bother it. Well, I mean, I'm just after, curious. I don't mean to be a wise boy. No, no, that's like, a great question. Cause I thought the same thing. I'm like, bears are smart. They can, they, there's some bears that have figured out how to open the bear can. Like, how do they not yeah. go get the bag? They will try to go after it, but they have nothing to grip onto. And if you've tied your knot tight enough, they can't get the knot open. So it's not that they don't go after it. It's just that they can't get it. Okay. In that makes sense. So yeah, yeah. They, they, well, they'll still go after it. Your bigger, your bigger sneaky thief are mice. Yeah. These are like cruel little thieves. Like they, they go after anything, which is one of the reasons I don't do shelters because they go after everything. What okay. kind of a knot do you tie then? Um, so like, this is where my ignorance is. I don't know the name of it. I tie that knot that, I don't know the names of knots, but it's like a loop and then you pull it through and then you pull it through and yeah. it makes it real, real mm -hmm. right, whatever that knot is called. Mm -hmm. If you go on the, like uh, the fishing or, line, if you go yes. on the ORSAC uh, website, they show you how to tie, what knots to tie. Yeah, that's and where I learned it. Yeah, there's a follow-up question from Pat. She says, uh, the almighty um, is heavier duty, not necessarily bigger than the Ursac Major. And Pat, I think you're correct. Uh, I think the almighty is resistant to rodents as well as the bears. I think the Ursac Major is just bear resistant. Just bears, yep. I did have, I did have a small uh, rodent um, attempt, little hole in my Ursac out in Montana the other summer. So it, that, I mean, he didn't, he didn't get inside, but he made a little hole. <laughs> they're, they're, they're crooks, they're criminals, those little mice. Um, now everybody has a different cooking system of what they like to do. Some people don't cook at all and that's okay. And there's just like, there's this wistful feeling like, oh, I'm gonna backpack 15 miles and then I'm gonna have a big campfire in camp. You are so tired at the end of the day that I very rarely make campfires and I certainly don't want to cook over top of it because I have to wait for coals and all that stuff. So some people have a, um, uh, what's called a mini mo or a mighty mo. Um, they have different brand names, but they're tiny little, the tiny little um, stoves. And then they put their, their pot on top of it. And a lot of backpackers only have one pot, right? They make everything in their one pot. Um, they have a, I have a titanium spork. I think it's in here. Um, I use a jet boil. So this is a jet boil. The gas hooks to the bottom of this because I make everything. I make my meals ahead of time in Ziploc bags. And like I said, Ziploc bags are your very favorite thing. And it is the only thing that I would say you absolutely need the brand name of. Now this is a great value bag. So I would not cook in this. You need to cook in a bag. You need the gallon freezer Ziploc brand, right? So I hook... This goes on the bottom of here. Oh, and then my gas can goes under here and I put water in it and it turns orange as it cooks. And then I've got something in here. So a, a backpacker meal might be a pack of ramen with spam thrown into it. And then you pour the water in and you mix it up, you squish it around, you let it sit and then you eat right out of the bag. So I make things for myself in advance because I can't, like the backpacker meals that you buy like on Amazon, Number one, I don't think any of them taste good. I think they all taste like garbage. They're also very expensive and I can't eat a whole one of those. So like I would have to save it and pack it out anyway. So I'd rather make my meals in advance of things I know that I like to eat. Um, I tend not to eat a whole lot because I've been snacking on jerky and stuff all day long. So I don't do a big, big heavy meal at the end of the day. But um, I do the water method. Jim and Heather might have different ways that they cook. How do you guys cook? Right, Heather. Again, uh, I was a Middle East hiker, so <laughs> um, yeah, I don't have my systems yet. <laughs> I'm gonna, I'm gonna get you. To, I'm gonna get you to be a, a jet boil person. What do you do, Jim? What's your cooking? Um, I just, I just boil water, and uh, I, I do, you know, simple things like 
you know, couscous, ramen, beans, and rice, north sides. Um, yep. North I, eat a lot, I eat a lot of cold food. I eat a lot of, you know, cheese and salami and tortillas and tuna and stuff like that. And, and, and you, you can get all of this stuff at the dollar store. You don't have to go to any fancy store. You don't have to go to Wegmans, but you can find, like, I'm just going to randomly go in here and find stuff that I eat. This is Honey Stinger. These are my favorite. I love them. Um, this is like my little snack and treat if I've been a good girl all day. Um, but you can have things like Oreos, right? So you want to keep snacks throughout the day. Um, I'm going to show that to my first aid kit. Um, but I have things like I have peanut butter that I get in a packet and spam singles and chicken singles. I have those. And then I have like oatmeal and... Um, I, I like to have a little treat at the end of the day and drink um, the Weiler's Pink Lemonade, the singles that I'll put in my bottle, right? I'm going to talk about water in a minute. But things like crackers and pepperoni, and stuff like that. So, and I keep all my food. You know, it's in, the Ziploc, in that bag. I also keep it in a, I have it organized by type in a Ziploc bag. Uh, I, I'd like to just pipe in on the meal situation. Sure. Um, I, I'm of an age. In fact, tomorrow I'll be 67. So I really have to watch out for salt. And a lot of the meals that were mentioned, a very high salt content. So you really have to be careful with the kind of stuff, or maybe it's just for a weekend, okay. But I think that's worth a look to see what the sodium content is of like North size and so on and so forth. Cause that's a really, really good adds point. Up. And you can do, um, one of the things I'll do is I'll take lettuce and put it in a bag and you can um, dehydrate stuff ahead of time. I dehydrate like strawberries and stuff like that so that I have fruit. Um, so there's, you can, you can definitely play around with, there's all kinds, if you Google like diabetics on trail or um, low salt content, there's lots of backpacker meals. Um, what gets, what gets frustrating to me on some of those sites is like they'll require a pan Right out there with a pan, right? So I will make things ahead of time for myself because I don't eat a lot of um, I don't eat a lot of breads and stuff like that. I'm not a big cracker person, um, although that's what I had. That's why I have it left because I didn't eat it. I'm a pepperoni person. I like turkey bites. I like cheese, hard cheese, like um, Cracker Barrel, but like cheese slices, um, string cheese. I have that. Um, I'm not a huge bread person, so I don't, I don't, and I, one of the big, one of the big hotties on trail are tortilla wraps. I don't like tortillas at all. I think uh, oof, they're gross. So I don't eat them. So I'll eat other things instead of tortillas, but I like peanut butter. So I'll eat peanut butter plain, just the peanut butter. Mm. Um, but I'm not a huge tortilla person. You kind of, you kind of get in a groove of the things you like to eat on trail. Like I don't eat ramen ever unless I'm on trail. That's the only time I'll eat it. I don't actually like it that much. Um, but I'll eat it on trail because at that point in the day, I'm just hungry. <laughs> and I'll throw spam in it, which is very salty. You can get the low sodium version, but I think that's still pretty salty. Or you can just, um, I don't put the whole pack in either, that whole sauce pack thing. I just put a little bit in just to give it a little flavor, but I don't use the, that's one of the reasons I don't like it is because I think it's too salty. Um, so you play around with the things you like. I guess. Yeah, I've, I've dehydrated lots of food and it's actually, I was, daunted by it but it's actually pretty easy and then it's just the portion making the portions like you were talking about so that it's and you just that throw water in it's no big deal so yep. it's, a, it's a great meal just add hot water so yeah and you learn over time like I learn like what I bring back is what I don't eat like I'm not a big I'm not a big Oreo person and I've been carrying these Oreos around for like a year <laughs> I want them I want to be able to choose them but I don't ever eat them like I eat <laughs> Surprise that's in there. That must be a new one that I just put in there. Um, the other thing that I carry is sort of a luxury item that fell out that I didn't get to show you is a bug net for my face. And I wear this in New England when I hike in New England because there are big black flies there that bite you. Uh, it's very light. I keep this in my front pocket. It fell out of my pocket. So I want to make sure I not forget to tell you about that, that key thing. Um, and then I have um, hand sanitizer. I always have a ton of it. I carry a toothbrush and toothpaste. Some hikers don't. I do. You want your toilet paper in a Ziploc and um, you want to have like, a, and you want to keep this in a very handy place because you have to pee a lot. If you're my age anyway, for me, you have to pee a lot. Um, but I have wipes. 
do yourself a favor and dry them out and then you can put water on them to re-wet them um, because then they weigh a little bit less if they're not wet. Um, but your toilet paper, just take a roll of toilet paper. D don't get snookered by REI and buying their fancy toilet paper. All toilet paper is biodegradable. Don't listen to their nonsense and pay $18 for their biodegradable toilet paper. Regular toilet paper works fine. Take the center out of it, squish it in half, stick it in here, put your hand sanitizer in there, your trowel in there, and then keep this in a handy place where you can reach it when you have to go. Then you're not looking for it. If you use wipes, which I do, I use them at the end of the day, wipe off my feet, wipe off the you know spots that smell the most so that I'm not disgusting to myself. If you're out on the trail a few days, you're gonna get right no matter what you do, but it makes me feel better. Um, and then your first aid kit, which my first aid kit is this. Now, with when I'm with the Girl Scouts, I'm required to carry this ginormous, like, like if somebody's leg is severed off, I'm going to be able to perform surgery in the backwoods. Somebody's leg is that bad, you're calling 911 or sending somebody for help, right? So I have Neosporin, I have some Band-Aids, I have tape and um, moleskin. I, the thing I carry the most aid that I use is um, Motrin, ibuprofen. That's the thing I need at the end of the day. I don't know. Do you have a big kit, Jim, for medical or Heather? You guys use big medical kits? I do. I carry it with me on every hike. <laughs> well, this is my other one. Like this is my, this is my one when I go out with restart. See, it's much bigger. When it's just me, it's this tiny thing. I don't know about you, Jim. Are you are you? Carving? Yeah, it's mine's pretty basic. I just I carry uh, some Luco tape, uh, basic you know, uh, um, like um, yeah, Neosporin, antibiotic, uh, enough that I can make a, a bandage if I have to. With you know, yeah, that's tape. in there too. Yeah, I got I got a little gauze pad, a little bit of um, yeah, alcohol wipes, you know, to clean a wound or something like yeah. that. Pretty basic. It fits in like a quarter size Ziploc bag. Yep, that's what I have. Sting cream, uh, alcohol. Um, I do carry um, uh, sun um, lip lip gloss. Not lip gloss. What is this called? Um, SPF. Thank you, the SPF for my lips because I'm a redhead or was a redhead before I went gray. So I burn really closely. I do carry a pocket knife. Some hikers don't believe it or not carry a knife. Now there's a big debate about whether you carry a gun on trail. That's your own personal choice. I do not carry a gun. I do I do own guns and I shoot archery, so I'm not against guns. I just know that in an emergency situation, I would end up shooting myself before I'd shoot anything else. So I don't carry it because it's a heavy thing. Guns and bullets are heavy. I do carry a knife, but I can honestly say in seven years of backpacking, eight, nine, nine years of backpacking, I have only ever used this to open that pepperoni pack because we can't secure anything else in this world, but we can secure pepperoni packs. And that's the only thing I really use. Them for. Do you, do you carry a knife, Jim? I have a, one of those little mini Swiss army things. And the only thing I use on it is the scissors to cut uh, Luco tape. Yeah. That, I feel like I've used it for that. I actually cut my Luco tape in advance. Yeah. Do you use a knife or carry a gun or a bow? Absolutely not. No. <laughs> I don't have a so, so those are things that, you know, I carry. Well, Squeak, I have a question and maybe I'm just jumping the gun. No, nope, that's you okay. Didn't mention, you didn't mention anything about like matches or a lighter. Is that a different segment? No, nope, you're, I probably accidentally skipped it. So I do carry um, in uh, my, like my food kit, I have both a lighter and waterproof matches. Mm -hmm. You definitely want to get the waterproof matches. You can get them at the dollar store um, and you can just carry them in a bag with the, the flint thingy that comes. And that's in, that's in my, for whatever reason, I couldn't find my um, like utility bag where I keep my electronics. I keep that in there. So mm -hmm. you, definitely want, um, you definitely want waterproof matches and a lighter. If your lighter gets wet, it won't work, but the waterproof matches will. So thank you for bringing that up. And I forgot to show you, I wanted to show you my whistle uh, compass combo. Um, a lot of through hikers do not carry this, but I am such a Girl Scout. It also has um, the temperature on it, but I've actually never looked at that, but I've never had to use the whistle and I hope I never do have to use the whistle, but I'd rather have it than not. So I keep it on my pack. And then when all the through hikers tell me I'm a big old dork, I just say that's fine because I'm a Girl Scout and I'm allowed to be a dork. Did I miss anything else? 
I want to talk about water and I don't have my filters here because I'm, I have to get new ones. So everybody has a different water system. Some packs have a water bladder in them. Some are built to have a water bladder put in them, both of mine do. I do not use a water bladder. I don't know if Jim or Heather do. I don't like drinking out of straws. And I, I, I don't know, that whole thing just creeps me out and it's not my thing. I use smart water bottles with a mini Sawyer squeeze. And then I go with clean water. And then when all that water is gone, I make one of the bottles a dirty bottle and I get my water from the creek or the pond or the puddle if I had to. I get the dirty water in there. I put the filter on top and I squeeze the water into my clean bottles. And I do that, that's part of my camp chores. At the end of the day, you wanna filter water for your next day for your cooking and stuff like that. So Jim, do you use a different system? Do you use a bladder or anything? A bladder? Uh, no, we similar. I use a one liter bottle with the Sawyer on it and that to drink out of. And then I have a two liter bladder I use to haul water to dry camp. Heather, do you do anything different? Camels? Do you take camels with you? I just uh, just the three liter uh, bladder. So some people do the bladders. Um, uh, the hikers that stayed with me, I would say maybe like one out of every 10 had bladders. The rest were by the time they got here. So and I probably didn't mention this. Hikers stay in my yard. So uh, I've moved here in July of 2019 and we've had 264 hikers stay in the yard. So, and then they tell me all their confessions and things like that. So um, a lot of them, they, their bladders break and they, the bladders aren't durable over long periods of time. So that's one of the reasons they switched to just the filters. And the, honestly, the filters are easier to me. I, I think they're easy. Sometimes I just drink right out of the filter. Like I just drink straight from the bottle. That's what I do. But I, I know. I, not a, that is not a good thing to do. We shouldn't tell people to do that, but that is what a lot of people do. Like, and, um, I think somebody got booted out here. Oh, here's Barbara and Melissa. Um, so I drink straight from the bottle. All right, so that's water and a uh, smart water bottle with a sports cap. That's the thing that you want. And I don't know why it has to be a smart bottle, but it only works with a smart bottle with the Sawyer squeeze. And I think it's because the water bottles are narrow so you can fit two of them in a side pocket of your pack, two on each side. Um, and then like you want to make sure when you're planning ahead that you know the water situation. Lehigh Gap is notorious. Pennsylvania, this section of Pennsylvania is notorious for not having water. So, um, you know, you want to know that if you're going to have a lot of streams to come up on, you don't need to carry as much water with you. Um, but like uh, um, on the CDT, for example, there are places where you have to carry like so much water. Um, so just know how much water you're going to need to have with you because you use water for cooking and you use water for drinking. Squeak, what did you say about the smart water bottles? I, I missed the part where you said the beginning, like. It should have the sports top, you know, the, the, the water bottles. Oh, the sports top. top. Okay. And you're going to okay. unhook that. You're going to take that off and you're going to put the squeeze on. But whatever, for whatever reason, that bottle, that shape bottle and that. I don't know what those are called. Reds. Thank you. That works with the Sawyer. And yeah. you, yeah, the Sawyer work with Aquafina as well. Oh, does it? Okay. Yep, yep. Yeah, it actually yeah, well. works with small, like, um, well, no, what were they? Deer Park bottles that I had. The, the oh, ones. good. Those good. work with them. But I haven't used it for a long time. But I like the Sawyer, and I drink straight from it. I squeeze yeah, it. I know. That's a bad practice. But I do it, too, because it's easier. Why is it bad practice? I don't get it. Well, you're supposed, like, best practice is to squeeze the clean water, squeeze the clean water into a clean bottle. Yeah. And have your three clean bottles of water. I have four dirty bottles of water and I just move the filter. That's easier to me. <laughs> that's what I do. <laughs> and that's a lot less of a pain in the rear end. Um, and honestly, like it works, but yeah, you know, I wanted to make sure we're not telling you, giving you our bad habits, but that is what most people do that do it that way. If they're not using the bladders, if they're using bladders, you have to have a way to filter it. And mm -hmm. stuff like that. Um, so this was like, I told you, I was going to tell you this again on your person, even when you're hiking, really, you should have on your person, a paper map, not so much for the AT, like when you're the AT is the AT and you're going to have your, either your gut hooks or your AT guide, you're going to have some other kind of map with you. But if you're doing a trail, like Sawmill Creek, you want to have a paper map on you with your emergency contact info. And that's really for first responders that have to come and get you. 
right? We want to be able to know who you are. Um, the whistle helps us, right? So even if it's dorky, it's going to help somebody find me or somebody injured that I'm with. And your waterproof matches. Yeah, I knew I mentioned them somewhere. You want to have your waterproof matches in case you have to build a fire while you wait for somebody. So where do you find all this stuff? Oh, go ahead. Uh, yeah, Beth, depending on where you are or where you're hiking, um, people might want to consider a satellite communication device for um, SOS. The it, Garmin, the Garmin right. is a really good, um, the Intrax series, they're expensive. They right? are. So they're expensive, but they definitely are worth it because your phone may not have signal all the time. And um, and I, I think I missed the slide where I talked about the extras. Um, you can have a Garmin inReach tracker that is sort of top of the line stuff. Um, I have a smartwatch and I wear, I wear Apple earbuds if I'm alone and I have an iPhone 7 and I have three anchor power cord chargers. So I make sure that they're all charged up because I have to have that many to charge this many devices for a, a four or five day trip or a three day trip. And then you want all your connecting cords, right? And I keep all of that in its own bag with the fireproof matches. And then I have my journal, paper, pencil and I keep a little Bible with me. So I don't want to skip over that stuff because if you have electronics, you know, you want to make sure um, that you can charge them and, you know, make sure they work. But don't rely on your phone because your phone will not, um, not always work on a trail. All right, so the two places you can shop, I mean, you can shop anywhere. You can shop at Walmart, you can shop anywhere for any of this stuff. But the two big ones that people kind of gravitate to are REI and Amazon. REI requires a $20 member, like it doesn't require, you can shop there without a membership, but you can pay $20 and you become a member. And the beauty of that is that if you become a member, you have a hundred day return policy. And that has been a lifesaver to me with both packs and shoes. Your big ticket items, the things that cost you a lot of money, you know, like my big Agnes, right? Like I can return that to the company, but like my, my Gregory pack, I started with an Osprey. That was the first pack I, I got when I got back into backpacking. I hated it because it didn't fit me right. I liked the bag. Like I liked how the bag functioned, but the bag itself did not fit me right. And I had had it out for a weekend. I was able to take it back and, you know, and, and exchange it for what I got when I got my Gregory and I love my Gregory. So, and then I bought, um, I bought the other backpack that I have this other one. I bought that on Amazon. So I can't return that to anywhere. Like I can't, like I'm stuck with that bag. Whereas with, um, with REI, I can return it. The flip side is that REI is expensive and they do have sales, but that just brings it down to the regular price of stuff. Like darn tough socks are the same price at Amazon as they are at darn tough as they are at REI. Some things you get breaks on, some things you don't. You're not, you're not gonna return your socks to REI if you buy darn tough, you're gonna return them to darn tough. So, you know, just kind of know it's worth it for the big ticket items. And then um, you get an annual dividend return for things that you buy at full price. So if you buy a backpack, like I, the other big Agnes I have is from REI. So I'll get the dividend back. I think it's 10% a year. So then you get that money to spend, um, you know, but buy your shoes there. Um, try them on, walk around with them, and then you can take them back if you don't like them. You know, you can take even shoes back. So um, I love I love REI for their their return policy. Yeah, Beth, let me tell that. Um, can I tell my story about REI? Yes, okay. tell your REI story. Okay, so like I was mentioning earlier about my Solomons. I loved my Solomons. I had these Solomons um, that went to many, many different countries with me. And so I went and I bought another pair of Solomons that I thought were going to be comparable within a couple months, they were really irritating my ankle. And then um, I went back to REI and these boots are over $200. <laughs> they took them back. And then they spent just some, um, I think Pat M just uh, commented too about this. Um, they spent an, like a good hour with me trying to find the boot that would work with my ankles. And they returned, yes. they took back my used, heavily used. Yeah. <laughs> They're, they're super great. They're super knowledgeable. Um, when I was in New Jersey, we lived near the IR, the REI in Princeton. So our, our three-day weekend trips for, for New Jersey restart, we started Friday night at REI. And I always tell people, listen, their job is to sell you stuff. So they're going to sell you all kinds of nonsense. They're going to try to sell you like biodegradable toilet paper. 
all toilet paper or his stuff biodegradable. You don't need to buy theirs. Um, but for the big ticket items, the shoes, the pack, the tent, it is a great, it is great. Unless you're buying direct from a company, like, like if you're buying directly from Big Agnes, you can return things if you buy it through Amazon. Amazon's great for, um, for like your consumables. And the one thing that I couldn't find, because it's in my utility bag, I have these little, this is like my pro tip from a through hiker two years ago. They're these little, like, you know, those magic towels that you have for kids that you put a little water on and they expand. Well, they have little dot ones. And I think they're called like big dots or something. They're like this big, they're tiny. And then you put a little bit of water, but you can wash your pot out with it. And you can also wash your face with it. And so you can also use it if you're out of wipes. So those are super light. And they're like, I bought a thousand of them on, on Amazon for like 10 bucks. So like, they're really, they're really great. So for consumables, returns can be a hassle. Mostly cheaper, but not always check because I got my I got my darn tough right from darn tough. I get better deals right from darn tough. Otherwise, they're twenty four dollars or whatever they are. Same with farm defeat. Pat, Pat said that uh, also they will fit you properly. The salesman worked with me for over an hour to custom fit my Gregory pack. Also for shoes, they told me even if I wore my shoes for months, they could be returned. Yep. Yep, they are great. That great comment, Pat. And they and it's worth it. It's worth that twenty dollars if you're really going to get serious in the backpacking. I definitely recommend paying the fee. And um, I, like my hiking pants, my um, full pants are from uh, from REI. I love them. I love those pants. And uh, I don't know. I just I like them, but I don't buy my consumables there. And I also don't. I don't buy backpacker meals. I don't buy any of that kind of stuff. Um, because I just can't eat any of that stuff. It's full of salt. They don't taste good. They taste like cardboard. Um, I would rather get an MRE and then break that apart because MREs are really heavy, um, and, but they have some good stuff in MREs that are a little bit tastier than those backpacker meals. I don't know. Jim, do you eat the backpacker meals? Or no, no, never. They're gross. Like they don't, they taste like cardboard. They yeah. all taste the same. No matter what they, what it says on the outside, it all tastes like cardboard. Um, oh, the other thing to say about REI is they have the uh, garage sale in the, oh, yes. what, I forget when that is, what month of the year, but they have that and that's um, usually gear that was returned and lightly used. Um, the, the good part about that is, is it's inexpensive. The bad part about it is you have to get there early and stand in line and you have, yeah. to, sort of, you have to sort of compete with people to find, you sort of have to know what you're looking for, which is not a really good position to be in as a first time backpacker. Um, so uh, probably the better deal if for a financial situation is they have sales usually at the major holidays, you know, Labor Day, 4th of July, um, and, and sort of just, if you just go to one of their stores, and ask, you know, when's your next sale? They usually have uh, um, pretty good sale items. And also I think if you remember, don't they give you like, there's some percentage off, 20% off a uh, full price item or something like that. Yep. And they, um, um, they, they do have like a lot of sales throughout the year too. And they do have a clearance bin and stuff. You can get stuff. Um, I went to one garage sale. It was like a madhouse. It was like black Friday shopping. It was like a madhouse. But one thing I do like about them is they, they are the sponsors of the opt outside movement, which we we've done opt outside hikes, uh, at least in New Jersey. I did COVID may change that this year, but in New Jersey, we did opt outside hikes on black Friday. They are closed. They do not participate in the black friday madness that the rest of the world um the day after thanksgiving they want you to go outside so i like that so i like them but i i buy gear wherever i can get it when you're hiking on the appalachian trail when you stop at a hostel or if you come here to my house i actually people have what are called hiker boxes where they get rid of gear and one of my favorite things to do when i was down in uh and springer last year in fact off of Springer Mountain because of COVID, because of my job. Um, there are hiker boxes down there full of all kinds of things that people bring like tomahawks and all this stuff that they're like, oh my, I don't wanna be carrying this when they're going to like, like either before or after Blood Mountain, they're like, oh, I don't wanna carry all this. So um, it's interesting how the, the hiker boxes change and then you just, you go through and you find stuff. So like, you know, if you don't like you buy I don't know, shrimp ramen and you don't like it, you can just throw your that into the hiker box. And then the next hiker that comes along will be like, hey, I love shrimp ramen. And I'll take that. I have a bunch of shoes here that people have left. Um, I have a hiker garden so that when they're here, they can they can have fresh vegetables and stuff out of the garden to take with them. Um, and so we planted, we took some of people's old shoes and we used them as planters. 
um, so that uh, so that you know there was um, flowers and things growing out of hiker shoes, and so hiker boxes are a lot of fun to look through. I'm going to write a book about hiker boxes because I think they're fascinating. What people uh, there's a story I taught English, so there's a story called um, the things they carried, which is about war and the things that people carry on them when they're in war. But I'm like I feel like we should do that for hikers, what people carry and get rid of at hiker stations. All right, so key points before we do Q&A. Planning is critical to a great experience. You wanna have an amazing time when you're out there so you don't wanna be stressing out about what you forgot to bring or what the weight that you're carrying because you brought your entire household with you. Remember that backpacking is hiking or you're staying overnight. Camping is camping. So make sure you always think about that and have that in your head, not to bring too much, but to bring what you need. Uh, be honest about your ability because you do have to carry it. Um, Jim, what is your base weight without food and water? Um, usually around 11 pounds. Okay, so I'm a little bit heavier. Without food and water, my summer gear is 19. My winter gear is 21. And that's what the zero degree bag is. My zero degree bag is a little bit heavier. But, um, you know, so without food and water, when they, when you read on a thing and it says base weight, that's without food and water, and then you put your food and water in. Um, so you want to plan for success. You want to do your research and your homework. Make sure you ask around. Plan for leave no trace. How are you going to get stuff out? You need to bring garbage bags, which are Ziploc bags. Don't overpack. Don't underpack. Take pictures, leave footprints, and then keep doing it. Like, keep doing it as often as you can. Your first experience might suck. Do it again. Go with people that you like, right? You know, go with people that are about your ability, right? Um, or if you have a friend who's an, a more experienced hiker but doesn't mind hiking slow and going with you and, and doing a training hike, go with that person. Just um, And then make sure that people know where you are in case that you need to be found. So that is everything I have for you. And now it's any other questions, free for all. And Jim, Heather, and I will try to answer. Now I can look at the chat. This is my email. If you think of a question later and you didn't want to ask here in public, you can send me an email. So I thank you everyone for coming. Um, we have another one of these in two weeks that it's on the meetup, you can sign up. Um, this has been recorded, so I'll post a recording um, after I, I process the video. And if you uh, think of any questions that you have later or if you have any question about some kind of gear that you're using, just let me know. I'll try to answer. I just put my email in there. If anybody would want to ask me any questions, I'm happy to help. Oh, perfect. Thank you. I have a we'll question. Oh, good. Go uh, are most of the people who are within this group now, are they Northeast Pennsylvania? Is this a uh, part of, because I know you have some hikes that you have planned and I'm really excited to hike with you just to get out and learn some new things. But I do hikes for Sierra Club, but overnights are something that I've never been comfortable with yet to bring people in to do that because I don't feel comfortable myself enough to to do that. So I'm gonna, I feel like I learned, I learned so much and I want to even learn more from you. So well, we have a hike. We have some coming up. The first backpacking trip is a winter trip, it, mm -hmm. and and it's the last weekend in in ugh, February. It is a winter hiking trip, but it's not a big hike. It's 0.5 from the parking lot to the shelter, and that's on purpose, right? It's specifically that way. That if you absolutely hate winter camping, you can get to your car, right? Oh, so it's an overnighter. And that's an overnighter. So that's at Kirkridge Shelter. It's oh, I love Kirkridge. the parking lot's on the AT. There's not going to be any through hikers hiking through then, maybe one or maybe one, but you know, not really. So you have the option of using the shelter if you want. And then, um, but it's going to be a small group. It's overnight, but it's to do winter kind of winter skills how to camp in the winter. But I made it so that it's close to the road. And that really is the only shelter that's here in Lehigh Gap, that shelter is only 0.8 from the road too. And up in um, Big Oven Knob, it's only like a mile, but that's really rocky. So if you would want to leave in the middle of the night, it, that would be sketchy. This is not as sketchy. So um, that's like a winter skills kind of hike. And then if you get to the, it gets cold out and you're like, you know what, this isn't me, then you can you can bail it without, without shame. 
Nine. Squeak. Yes, 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 yes. I think you're muted. Sorry, um, I'm looking in the chat, but I'm not seeing your email here. It's on the screen. Do you see it on the screen? Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. I'm sorry. I can put it in the chat though. Oh, it. there it is. Oh, I get it. Okay. No worries. I'll put it in. I'll put it in here too. Oh wait, Jeep. I almost sent that to you directly. Sorry about that. Um, there it is in the chat too. Oh, sweet. Let's Thank you. Announce Ritter Guth. So that overnighter at Kirkridge, that's this February. Yes, that's at the end of this month, last weekend. It's a. Wait, I, don't, I don't think I saw that. It might be waitlisted, but like even sign up for the waitlist because people bail. Heather will tell you. Heather is our attendance captain, and Heather will tell you that we have a lot of people that sign up sort of habitually and habitually cancel. So, um, and that's very frustrating because it means that other people can't go. And these hikes are the my hikes specifically. My hikes and trips are for absolute beginners. No experience, never put a hike and shoe on in my life. <laughs> like that's, you know, that's, that's, and Heather's hikes are for people who are beginners, but are more, a little bit more moderate, can do a little bit faster walking. Um, like I have people with different abilities on my hikes, but Heather's hikes, she's got a good core group that go a lot. And, um, and they, they don't go, they're not going hundred miles an hour, but they're also not doing a mile an hour. So, Beth, Beth, maybe you want to talk about uh, sort of ways to camp in the winter if you don't really have winter gear, because I don't think these folks are going to run out and buy a zero degree bag for a winter right. trip. So right. you know, whatever bag, they're probably going to have a three season bag. Talk about maybe some of the tricks and tips that you might use to stay warm if you don't have a winter bag. So you're, you definitely want to layer, and, and this will actually go out to that group. That thing. So I'll send these tips out to them also. Um, but you definitely want to layer your clothing and you want to make sure that uh, not cotton, you want to be using merino wool. There's a, a strategy for how you layer your clothing, pants, tops, shirts, gloves, hats. Um, uh, you know, we have masks, but uh, I use like a gator, um, uh, 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 like a like a neck thing over my over my face. And then you want to um, if you're not staying in the shelter right? Like shelter is a little bit different, but if you're staying in your tent, you definitely want to um, put yourself up a little higher. And then if you're in snow, that's a whole different thing, right? You have to like, you know, um, dig out where you're going to be and then pack the snow down so that it's nice and packed down. So all those are like very specific winter skills that apply to winter, <laughs> winter backpacking. I don't know, Jim, if you want to go into more detail than that. It's like, it, there's so much more to know about winter backpacking um, that I, I, I wouldn't necessarily put with the other three seasons, but I don't know if you want to talk about some of the things that you do. Um, I've not, I don't, I don't camp in snow. <laughs> I don't put my tent in snow. I will stay in a shelter if there's snow, but I've, not had I, last year we didn't have a lot of snow so I went out but there wasn't there was just a light layer there wasn't a lot out there do you so are there tips of things that you do well, that I yeah I guess for me if it, if I've never spent a night outside before going on a winter night out would not be my way to start right that's a that is a good point Jim I didn't know what that's what you're getting at if you've never backpacked before the winter trip is probably not the best first time best first time is in the spring yeah nice and you're smelling flowers and you're hearing the birds and you're seeing the flowers and you're seeing the trees and you're getting chased by like mommies and their ducklings and stuff like that winter camping is really um I didn't think I was going to like it, which is why I never did it. I do like it because I like to be in the woods all the time and it doesn't matter to me, but it is, it's a lot more challenging because you have to bring a lot more and you have to constantly be thinking about hypothermia and other things, right? So I wouldn't, I, Jim is absolutely right. It shouldn't be your first, first trip out the gate. Another thing you can do for winter, if you've never winter camped before is Camp in your backyard once or twice. Yes, that's a and that's actually true of any. Like before you go out in the woods, go in your backyard. Seriously, set up your tent. You have to set it up to spray the permethrin anyway. Like, like go outside, 
camp in your yard and then practice little scenarios. Like, what am I going to do if I hear a bug or I hear an elephant, you know, like, you know, <laughs> but I, um, I recommend wearing earbuds at night or earplugs, like the little orange ear things, because you like, it, it does like, there's a lot of noise in the forest that you don't think about because you don't hear it when you're walking, but that noise just goes on all day long, but definitely that's a definite pro trip pro tip, Pat practice in your yard. Practice everything, blowing everything up and then time yourself. Like that, that was my big thing. Like how fast can I get my tent up if it's windy, right? Like if I'm having to hold like everything, like if it's windy, go outside when it's raining and put your rain gear on and set up your tent in the rain so that you know what that feels like. And if you hate that, you're really going to hate it when you're not in your backyard because you can't just go in and take a shower. I have a couple of questions. Um, sure. One is about... Okay, so let's say it's winter camping. Maybe there's snow. Maybe there isn't snow. But I'm in a tent, and I'm and I have let's say, um, you know, one of the uh, blow up sleeping pads. And the the wisest thing for me seems like to put the mylar something or other. You know, the silver mylar so it reflects heat back. I want to put that underneath. Now, do I put it underneath the pad, or do I put it underneath me on top of the pad? So people do it both ways. I do it with it under the, I do the, the mylar here, then my inflatable and then my bag because my bag hooks on to, onto it all that way, like a sandwich. Oh, right, right, right. Okay. But I've seen it done both ways. So I think it's just preference. And the other I wonder about the baffling of the air between if that's cold and it's wasting energy. I, I don't yeah. know. Yeah. The other so thing I forgot question. to mention is stick the hot hands. Take oh, yes. hands and hot toes, crack open a few puppies and stick them in the bottom of your bag. Oh yeah. Sure. That's good. Nice and warm. Yep. And I wear socks. Uh, I, don't, I can't wear socks to bed any other time, but I wear socks when I'm camping, like in yeah. a, even in the fall and spring. Uh, the yeah. other question I have is about elevation. Um, you know, I, I'm, I'm not, I'm not set on just doing flat terrain like scrambling and that kind of stuff, I don't think I'm able to do that anymore. So how would you gauge like beginner slash intermediate? How would you gauge that in terms of elevation? In other words, how, how much elevation before it becomes intermediate, do you think? So that is a really good question. And that is actually something that uh, I think, I think Heather and I work at that because um, I, the restart hikes when I first started restart in New Jersey were three miles or less with very little elevation gain. It was to get people out in the woods so that they would feel comfortable in the woods and want to come back and build up skills. Um, then we have people who built up skills, right? When we came to Pennsylvania, it was the same thing. But now we have people who built up some skills and then that's kind of, they can do a little bit bigger, bigger climbs. They can do a little bit longer days, right? And that's really what Heather does. All of my hikes are under three miles, unless I say, unless I say that it's more, right? Mm -hmm. Per mile flat, right? But they're always relatively flat, you know, mm -hmm. like hills and like. And yeah, have, have you done Jacobsburg, the Jacobs no. um, Loop? I can't remember what it's no. called, Henry Woods. So that's that's about the edge of what I'll take the the turtles on, and I do all the turtle hikes. So um, I try not to do steep inclines and and the reason why is we have some people in the group who are differently abled and can't mm -hmm. physically do uh, because they don't have full range of motion they're they're mobile but they don't have full range of motion in all the four limbs mm -hmm. so um and i learned a very important lesson a few weeks ago that i i rated a hike as easy that was easy to me which was not easy to a person that was different oh, and i learned a very good lesson that day right I need to be my, more mindful. So I try to really be honest about um, about the uh, ups and downs on it, but also the rocks. Because it can yes. be for five miles, but it's boulder sized rocks. And so you're scrambling. And right. that's not fun if you don't have full range of motion either. So so let's say, for example, I wanted to choose a hike, uh, a, a section of the AT. Am, am I able to determine on looking at a map how much of that would be let's say scrambling and how much of it would be more easier. 
So it depends on the map, right? If you use a topographical map, you can kind of tell incline and decline. What you can't tell are rocks. Mm -hmm. so if you want a flat piece in Pennsylvania, I recommend going down to like the um, the like the border of Pennsylvania and hiking up through like Carlisle. That's all fields down there. That's a big uh -huh. field. But wow. the only problem with that is you can't camp in those fields. So yeah. you're gonna have to do an out and back because you won't mm -hmm. do the 17 miles of that far right. in one shot. But you can do an out and back that's pretty nice. Um, I'm trying to think of, on the AT in Pennsylvania, the 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 we're in a tough spot in, in Lehigh Gap because this is super this is in Lehigh Gap takes out through hikers. They come mm. ready to quit because they've now done these rocks. And then I say, listen, this is nothing. Wait till you get up north. This is like mm. just like practice baby steps. But it's the first time if they're northbound that they're dealing with this kind of a rock. Mm -hmm. The first time they're dealing with this kind of terrain. So it this is very challenging. I would never take newcomers in the in in the gap in the both sides of the Lehigh River, out of mm -hmm. the gap. I would never take them there. But um, when you go to like Banger, like that trailhead, which is the which is the same trailhead that we're going out from for the winter camping, that's pretty reasonable there. It's not mm -hmm. too bad. It's when you go then into the Delaware Water Gap that you're gonna mm -hmm. that last. Um, Heather, you hiked the Delaware Water Gap. Where did you guys park? Um, we did Mount Mincy, and um, so it's a small parking lot. I think maybe, uh, well, it's opened up a little bit more. Um, I think you can get like 20 cars in there, uh, maybe at max. But mm -hmm. that was a steep, that was a steep hike. Yeah, that's that's really steep. So this around here isn't isn't great, but the closer you go toward like Duncannon and um, out by Cabela's, which is Port Clinton, like that way, it's a little bit flatter. Nice, a nice, good flat piece of trail that's great and wide and has lots of dispersed camping. Dispersed camping is like already made nice campsites. If you park on 309 across from the Thunderhead Lodge, there's a little trail, Appalachian Trail parking lot there. And if you hike, is it northbound or southbound? If you hike toward Bake Oven Knob, right? But don't go all the way to Bake Oven Knob. There's a nice wide trail there with uh, dispersed camping on both sides. There's a beautiful overlook of Nutripoli there. That's not hard hiking and that's not a steep incline at all. That's a nice, I think it's maybe three miles into that one campsite that I'm thinking, and you'll know you're there because it's got a big stone. Somebody made a big fireplace there, like a fire pit and it looks over at Nutripoli. Mm -hmm. If you wanted to, you could drop your gear and then try to hike up to Bake Oven, but Bake Oven is rocky. Bear mm -hmm. is rocky, Knife's Edge is rocky. Um, and those are scrambles, but you can do a nice piece there that's not too rocky. It's not terrible rocky and it's wide and it's a nice path and you have some nice views. That sounds great. Uh, thanks a lot for your help. I appreciate that. You're welcome. Also, also um, All Trails gives you elevation gain. Um, so you can look at that as well. Okay. Yep. And, and the um, AT distance calculator will give you the distance up and down too. The right. So, so in terms of it being a more of more of a beginner it would be a couple of hundred feet 300 feet gain and then it starts to get into I, I try to like look around like if it's more than a thousand feet that to me is intermediate I don't know Heather do you what feet do you look at feet um sometimes I do I, I just look at length <laughs> yeah no, length. I, I look at length I do look at I do look at um incline and decline right I do look at that but I I always think of, um, I think under a thousand, I think is, and then I'll, but I hike it and that's where, really where I get the sense of it. What, what I do is I look at, uh, I look at the overall gain, but also look at the grade. Um, so, and, and you can't do this everywhere, but um, like gut hooks will give you um, um, an elevation profile and you can sort of estimate how many feet per mile a section would be. And, um, mm -hmm. uh, I, I, I consider steep anything over 600 feet per mile um, and up is steep. So 600, 800, 1,000 feet per mile, but not so bad as in the sort of three and 400 range per mile. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. That's really helpful. Thanks a lot. 
And th this is all trails. I, I brought all trails up. So what you do is you, you type in, I just typed in Palmerton, but you can, um, you just enter a city or a park. So let's say um, Pennsylvania, I'm just gonna put Pennsylvania. And it'll say best trails in Pennsylvania. It gives you this map with the number on it. And then like Mount Mincy, which is what, um, you know, was rated moderate here, but I don't know. I wouldn't rate that moderate for new people. So okay, click on no click on that. Difficult. That is definitely a difficult. Click on that and see what elevation it is. So it gives you like the little description here. Right. Thousand. And then if that thousand feet is the elevation gain. Um, but it does, what it doesn't tell you is rocks too. Mm -hmm. Here in Pennsylvania, it's rocks. But then there'll be um, ratings of it. And then there mm -hmm. are recordings of it where you can see recordings. Um, like I could look at this person's recording of it. Um, but it tells you like some of the trails are real busy. You know, this person really, mm -hmm. really loved it. Um, let's find somebody who hated it. Oh, nobody really hated it. Um, but I, the thing I am always careful with in all trails is that people who use all trails are usually hikers. So an easy hike for an experienced hiker is mm. different than an easy mm -hmm. hike for a new hiker. Yes. You know, so I try to always keep that in mind for the turtle hikes to make sure that they are actually easy. And I, I did, I got my hand, my head handed to me two weekends ago, you know, and it really taught me a lot. And the person did a great job, but I mean, that was my fault because I did not rate it correctly. It was definitely a moderate hike for a, per, a new hiker who mm -hmm. had hiked before. So mm -hmm. uh, I learned a lot. All right, cool beans. Thank you. Any other questions before we go off into the world and plan our big adventures? Well, thank you everybody for coming. I appreciate your, your coming. I hope I see you in two weeks. And uh, I think, I can't remember what our next topic is. I think next topic is, is it map reading? Is that the next one? I don't know. Let's look it up. I will look it up because I don't remember now. It takes forever for this to all right, let's see. The next one is reading a map. Yep, and choosing uh, using a compass and trail navigation, what to do when you get lost, um, some tips and tricks for um, what happens when you get lost, how to do a smoke signal, stuff like that. So that's, that's the next one. And then after that, tenor hammock, we'll do some comparison. I'm going to have some people who are ultralight come in. And we're all gonna show our, and talk about our gear and praise it. And uh, hopefully Jim and Heather will come back for that. And uh, then we're gonna talk about cooking and we're gonna have cooking demos. And I'm gonna convince Jim and Heather to uh, cook some meals as well. And we'll all have cooking demos for you. So you can see the difference and, and go into more detail about what work. I have an alcohol stove. I always think I'm gonna burn down the forest with that. Like it blows all over. I made a shield for it and then the flame flying and I think I'm like gonna burn the place down. So I, I'm but the jet oil is a pain in the butt to carry though. I will say it's bulky and awkward. So thank you everybody. Have a great night and we'll see you hopefully in two weeks. Thanks Beth. Bye -bye. Thanks so much. Take care. Bye-bye. Uh, Beth, that was really nice. This is a lot thank of you so much. It. Thank you, Beth. Talk about what I love. <laughs> Take care. Bye -bye. Thank you guys.